So it's uh, 8 o'clock. It looks like we got a uh, fairly decent sized crowd. <coughs> Hello, welcome. Uh, this is the Anatomy and Matplotlib tutorial. I'm Ben Root. I'm one of the uh, core developers. I may not be very active, but I uh, have been involved in Matplotlib for almost 10 years now. Um, and this will be the fourth time I've given this tutorial here at SciPy. So People seem to like it, so I hope you guys enjoy it too. Helping me out is Hannah. If you could uh, raise your hand. Yep. Back over here. Uh, Hannah will also help out in uh, presenting some of this, but also she'll be around helping you out. Uh, just wave your hand. Um, if you want to ask me a question, or ra ra raise your hand and you know, tr try to get her attention, or post a question on Slack um, and uh, Maybe Hannah or somebody else will notice it. Uh, or, why don't you turn to the person to your left, say hello. Turn to the person to your right, say hello. Of course, that, that doesn't quite work because they're also looking to their right and left at the same time. So, but just say hello. <laughs> but yes, those are another. Those are other people you can help that can help you out and you can ask questions. You can talk with. That's perfectly fine. Get to know each other. Get to know. Uh, all this. So what are we all here for? We're here for plotting. We're scientists. We like visualizing our data. Matplotlib is the library in Python to do scientific visualization. And this is uh, why we are all here. So to get started, uh, you would have uh, done uh, launching your Jupyter Notebook, which I Hope everyone here has figured out by now. This is the second day's tutorial, so you know how to start that up. If you have not been able to figure that out, please get Hannah's attention. She will help you out because you will be in for a very boring four hours. Okay, so we get that launched, and we'll end up. And so you'll end up at this page, and you'll see a bunch of. Uh, Jupyter Notebooks, there's a part zero. I originally created this tutorial for my coworkers at uh, Atmospheric Environmental Research, where which then I had to basically teach everything from scratch, so I created a part zero just to kind of give them a quick little primer into NumPy. We're not gonna go over that today. Uh, this is kind of, I wouldn't even call it a sheet sheet, it's just more of just getting the idea of that there are these n-dimensional array objects that they exist and, and you can do math with it. Uh, so we're going to start with part one, figures, subplots, and layouts. OK, when you click on that, you get to this page right here. And so this is this large enough for everybody? If it's not, please raise your hand. I will make it larger. OK, or you also have it on the screen right in front of you. All right, uh, and then uh, for those of you who may be, this may be your first day at a conference, whatever, you may not have learned the wonders of shift enter. So you don't have to actually click on the cell and then go to hit the play button or anything like that. No, you can do shift enter and that will execute the cell. All right. So you are all scientists at the very least, I hope, of one form or another, a researcher or, uh, you know, or publishing scientist or you're an engineer or something like that, you're all doing visualization in one way or another. I, I don't even care if you're blind. I'm merely blind. It doesn't matter. You're doing visualization one way or another. And so Matplotlib is going to be the thing that gives you that tool it gives you that ability to make publication quality plots. But in addition to making publication quality plots, it's also great for the quick and dirty plots as well. And so you can do the quick, vi visualize your data. You don't, don't even bother with all the axes, labels, and stuff. You just want to take a look at what, what you have for a quick moment. It's great for that. It's also great for those really pixel perfect got the font right and the size and everything, you get all that right, it's good for both. Matplotlib does not get in your way to doing either of those things. It's what I call not stupidly unhelpful. <laughs> so it lets you, uh, gives you as much control as you want, 
but you can concede as much control as you want in order to get the job done. We have uh, tons of documentation online at matplotlib.org. We have galleries, uh, uh, frequently asked questions, API documentations, and tutorials. Another tutorial that isn't listed up there is a fantastic one by uh, Nicholas Ruger. Um, I'll, uh, we'll, we'll post the uh, URL to this at some point. Um, but it's another fantastic tutorial that he has made. It's not a Jupyter notebook or anything like that, but it's wonderful. And then he's also working on some uh, online books as well, freely available that you can get that's fantastic for examples and, uh, and just kind of get an idea of the things you can do. Um, so what often, ha unlike other libraries where in which you go, okay, I need to know how to do a Gaussian filter. I need to know how to do uh, some sort of uh, skeletonization of my image. I need to do you know, this sort of processing and you know, make, how to make a neural net. You can go look up those words and you can go find the documentation for that. You just, all you have to say is Python and then neural networks and you'll get what you want. Or you do Python and the map, uh, visualization a lot of times you're just kind of like, well, how do I have the plots so that I have the dots over here and the labels over here and the color bar horizontally, but on top, you, how do you enter that into Google? <laughs> you know, uh, then again, there was a presentation yesterday that showed me that SketchUp stuff, that was pretty cool, so, I, um, so maybe you could draw it out and maybe Google will then tell you, but um, we have the gallery. That's sort of a poor man's search engine in, in many respects, where which you can go through that gallery and you can see the thumbnails of many, many different kinds of plots. And you might see, and then you click on any one of those and it takes you to the code that used to generate them. And they're very well commented, very well explained so that you go, okay, I need this piece and that piece, for, you know, this piece from this uh, thumbnail, and this piece from that gallery example, and this piece from that, so that you can then go, ah, okay, now I have the uh, plot that I want. We also have the mailing list, very, very useful resource where in which most of the developers and uh, uh, power users of matplotlib are frequent, so we can definitely answer questions uh, that way. And what's great about that, you can just kind of post an image of what you have so far, and you kind of say, I kind of want to get this way. We can help you out with that. We have Stack Over, we have a bunch of people who are active on Stack Overflow, and we also have Gitter. Uh, Gitter is more used for more technical questions or at least to help di direct you to a correct place. Um, but it is a useful uh, place. We're very welcoming. We're not, you know, someone, we're, we're not a group of people that tells you go away. Um, no, we're, 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 at least I certainly would hope that we're, we seem very welcoming. Um, at least no one has complained to me, so. <laughs> um, so the project is hosted on GitHub. And so that's where you'll file any bug reports, things like that. If you're not quite sure you have, you found a bug, go ahead and post a question on the mailing list first and go, is this a bug? Is it behaving like this? Maybe I'm just doing it wrong? Or sometimes we'll decide that it's not a bug, but we need to improve the documentation or something better, things like that. So if you're not sure, you don't want to f open up a bug report on GitHub, go ahead and ask a question on the mailing list and we'll, uh, we'll direct you. <clears throat> When you file a bug report, often what happens is uh, we're gonna ask you what is the back end you're using. Or, more specifically, we also wanna know which Python you're using. And when we say that, what we wanna know, well, we wanna know what version of matplotlib you're using, obviously, but we wanna know whether or not you're um, using the normal Python in an interactive setting or just simply running a Python script or if you're using IPython or Jupyter. Because things behave a little bit differently in the different things, and so some things that may look like it's a bug in one situation may actually not be a bug in, uh, in the others, so we wanna know all this stuff. But the other important piece of information we know is your back end. And while most of you will never care what back end you're using, it's important for the bug report. Um, and so the back ends is what uh, allows you to use matplotlib on basically 
any system. It works on Linux, Windows, Macs. I've had people uh, report they're able to get it to work on a Raspberry Pi. I've had you know, people say that you can do this and that. Great. You can do, use GTK. You can use WEX. You can use uh, TK, uh, t Tinker, and you can use uh, QT, QT4, QT5, doesn't matter. Uh, you can use all these things. Um, and it brings, and that's your GUI interface. Or you can just not have any interface whatsoever, and you're just simply creating PNGs or, or uh, SVG files. You're just creating files right out, so you're not picking any backend. You didn't explicitly choose any backend, but if you're filing a bug report or something like that, we need to know which backend you're using, because sometimes the uh, backend, there may be a bug in a particular backend. So this little thing right here will uh, report to you the information that we want to know when you file a bug report. So in this case, we're using the inline backend uh, for, uh, for IPython. Uh, that's our backend, but in other cases, you'll see GTK AG, QT AG, or WEX AG. Don't worry so much about the name, just tell us which one it is, and it'll be a huge amount of uh, information for us. Uh, a little bit more about the back end. In Jupyter, Jupyter, the browser is your GUI, not GTK or WEX or QT, things like that. So we have a special back end. Well, we don't actually have it. No, no, we, we, we have it, but Jupyter also has one as well. Um, and it helps determine whether or not it's interactive and stuff and for the browser. Uh, for Jupyter is a backend called MBAG. And so for that, uh, we're going to, you see up here that the backend here was back, backend inline. Uh, that's the Jupyter uh, built-in uh, backend. It's not interactive. Also, any images and stuff made are static and stuff, and so it's not very useful. So we want the interactive one. And so we're going to explicitly say, mbag, matplotlib.use mbag, and you'll see that now the backend has changed to mb for notebook, and ag is the uh, anti-grain graphics, so don't worry about that, that's the, that's, the, that's the renderer. Now, once you have done that use, most of the time you will never need to do this. And I'm just doing it here just to explain to you because you may come across example where in which these things are used and such. Uh, so you may uh, need to know what this is, so you're at least familiar with what you're seeing, but most of the time you will never need to select this. And you should write your codes in such a way that you don't bother with this. That only if you know that you need to use it do you ever call it. Um, so Jupyter and IPython, you have the thing called the IPython magics. Uh, they're basically when you have uh, the percent sign and then some command. So you may have seen it in the past few days, or percent uh, time it, or percent uh, p run, or something like that. You may have seen some of these things. There is a Jupyter magic, uh, an IPython magic uh, percent matplotlib that triggers everything necessary to load up a backend uh, that is for uh, Jupyter. Uh, or if you want to say to use something else, you can do that. It's, it's a backend magic that's specific to IPython and Jupyter. You wouldn't have this in any of your regular uh, Python scripts. Um, by default, when you just simply say percent matplotlib, it will turn on the interactive um, version of the Jupyter uh, backend or the IPython backend. And what that means is that plot.ion is, is also triggered. And what that means is that as soon as you issue um, a command for plotting, the figure shows up. And that is not the default behavior when you're executing matplotlib code through a Python script or something like that. So I find that kind of confusing to, uh, that's a confusing point for many people when they're first learning this, because usually they're using Jupyter first to learn matplotlib. And then they go to write Python scripts, and then they find out that does not behave like the Jupyter. No, nope, that's because Jupyter is the exception. IPython is the exception. 
because they're meant and designed for interactivity, whereas Python scripts and the Python REPL is not it, it designed for non-interactive uh, interface. So I want to try and make this feel more like Python script, scripting and, and Python REPL rather than the Jupyter interface. So, so what ends up happening is that when you do percent matplotlib in Jupyter, you do not need to call plot.show to finally show the figure. Whereas in normal uh, matplotlib, nothing shows up until you say plot.show. So how many people here previously, previously used Mat, MATLAB? What I like is this number has been getting less and less each year. I like this. Um, in, Matplotlib, in MATLAB, you have to keep saying, uh, every single time you do a plotting call of some sort, something shows up on your screen, right? And so you, it, every single call, and you, and you have to say, I off, to stop it. Well, the def uh, yeah, you have to, yeah, you have to say, I off, to stop it. Matplotlib, the default is I off, whereas MATLAB, the default is I on. So if you want to think of things that way. All right. Let's move on with the show. So first things first, we're going to, get a, we're going to go over some uh, terminology so that way you guys aren't confused when I'm describing things later. And that's the anatomy of a plot. So we have here, which is obviously too big for my display here, um, a figure window that would show up when you do plot.show. Um, and so it, it looks like a normal GUI window. You have yourself a toolbar. Uh, some GUIs, the toolbar is at the bottom. Other GUIs, the, uh, when I say GUIs, the, the back end. Some back ends, the, the toolbar is at the bottom. Other back ends, the toolbar is at the top. Minor difference, um, but it is composed of the axis subplot, which there may, may be one or more axis subplots. So sometimes we call them axes, sometimes we call them subplots. They're basically interchangeable. Officially, they're axes, the plural. Yes, I know. It's, even though right here I have one subplot, it's plural axes, and I'll get into that in a second. It's because it's made of two or more axes. So you have the y-axis and you have the x-axis. And so a subplot is composed of two or more axes. And so they're uh, axis, axes. Gotta love English. Um, and so therefore we call it an axes object because it's an object that contains multiple axes, axes. <sighs> And for, for, for a figure window that you have, the GUI window, you have one figure. And so the figure object is the thing that contains one or more subplots. And so it's very much like MATLAB. In MATLAB, you're making a figure, and then you uh, make an axis. You, know, you call it GCA or something like that uh, in MATLAB. It's a subplot, and axes is the same thing in MATLAB. John Hunter, who originally wrote this library, he, is, he, he was a refugee from MATLAB. So a lot of the design of matplotlib comes from uh, in some inspirations from MATLAB, for better or worse. There are some things I like from MATLAB, and there's some things that really bugs me in MATLAB. So hopefully uh, the things that bug me don't overwhelm the things that are really good here, so. All right, so and then this description here kind of explains what I have. So an axis object, you will almost never actually uh, deal with an axis object directly, but to know, you need to know that the axis object is the thing that has the tick labels, the ticks, the limits, and the, and the uh, axis label things like that, so that's where all that stuff is contained, but you almost never interact with that directly. You'll interact with the axes object, and you'll say set x label, set y label, set x ticks, and things like that. We'll go through some examples of that shortly. So let's uh, actually make something. 
And hopefully some of these examples here are gonna help clarify uh, some of the things I've been saying. So first things first, um, what you'll typically find for your imports, you guys have, if any of you here are brand new to Python, Okay, so we have a couple people here. So you know that with Python, you're importing packages. That's something you don't do in MATLAB, um, but you do do that in Python. So the two most common packages you're gonna be doing when you're doing plotting is gonna be NumPy, which you typically import as MP, and then you'll import matplotlib.pyplot as PLT. These are common conventions. Other people have done it different ways, uh, but this is the most common and generally accepted uh, uh, thing. Some people will you know, do from matplotlib import pyplot. I, I'm lazy, I'm a developer, I'm really lazy. I don't like typing all those extra letters, so uh, I just do plt for plot, so. All right, so we're gonna create a figure. Fig equal plot.figure I, I, I gave it a face color here just to try to make it uh, visible. By default, it's the, the back is white, so and since the background of the Jupyter Notebook is white, you wouldn't even notice it there, so I made it uh, slightly red. Um, so let's execute that. Oh, I forgot to, pff, oops, forgot to run that. All right, now we'll execute that. Nothing happened. Remember what I said, the back end that I chose, the MBAG back end, acts more like how you do things with normal Python scripts. Nothing is gonna show just because you created a figure. In MATLAB, if you created a figure, you would get a figure right away. But you may not want that. But it does show up once you tell it to. Matplotlib will do what it's told. Much more cooperative than my children, but. So here you, you see a figure, slightly red here, it's kind of big and all that, but there is a figure. And then you have yourself a toolbar down here for the MBAG backend. Looks a little bit different than that uh, image I showed you earlier, but uh, it's still basically the same idea. But it's a blank figure, it's not useful. Um, also notice that the size of this thing is you know, huge, you have to scroll and all this stuff and it's just, you know, not useful. Um, there's a useful function. Um, you, you, can de you can define the size of your uh, figure window, but oftentimes I never want to remember that. I just kind of know that I want something that's twice as tall or maybe is twice as long than it is tall or something like that. You can use a nifty little function called fig aspect and you say that I want it twice as tall as wide, so you say 2.0 uh, for fig aspect, and it will provide the fig size arguments for you. Nice and useful. Question over here. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you why the face color has four numbers? Usually if it are to be, have three, right? So the question is, you, 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 you notice it that the uh, face color thing was uh, four numbers, right? Yeah. yeah. R, G, B, alpha. Okay. The alpha is the transparency. Oh, okay. Yeah, so if I took that out, yeah, it, 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 you're like, well, oh, the color changed. Well, actually, no, the transparency changed, so because what's behind it is white. So, anyway. So the, you're still not a very useful thing, but you have a figure. That's fantastic. And figures, uh, objects, you can resize all you want, things like that, so. Axes. Now we actually want to get to the nitty gritty of actually plotting stuff. So we're, all the plotting happens to an axes object. Now you're not gonna actually create, you're not gonna call the axes constructor for those of you who know what that is. No, we, we, we don't make you guys do that. You know, you call a method on figure or, or a function on uh, pyplot to do this. So this is a typical example. Uh, so there's also fig add axes. That's like the base level stuff. Don't worry about it. Very rare that you ever actually need to use it. What typically is used 
is at fig .add subplot. And 111, those of you from MATLAB, that should look very familiar to you. So yes, we duplicated that feature, quote unquote. You can also do one comma, one comma, one if you wanted to. What it just simply means one row, one column, first uh, subplot. So if you did one, two, one, one row, one, two columns, but the, the first, fig, first uh, subplot. So. so here we're going to add a subplot, just a single subplot, and we're going to set the X limits. We're going to set the Y limits. We're going to give it a title. We're going to give it a... Uh, a label for the y-axis, we're going to give it a uh, label for the x-axis, a whole bunch of stuff all in one command, and then show it, right? See, there's our title right there at the top. Notice you didn't need to tell it which font. You didn't need to tell it what size. You didn't need to tell it really much. You just gave it the relevant pieces of information. You could change the font. You could change the, the, uh, the color, things like that. But there's plenty of good defaults in there that most of the time you're never going to care about that. Here's the Y axis. Note the limits went from negative 2 to 8, which if you go up to the command, the Y lim, negative 2, 8, it's like it's magic. X axis, there's the label there, and it went from 0.5 to 4.5. What's the limits that I specified? 0 0.5 to 4.5. Magic. I didn't see you change the aspect ratio, but it looks like it changed. Remember the last right, the aspect ratio did change here because I didn't specify the fixed size, so it went to the default, which is different than the, fig, the aspect ratio that I had here when I used fig aspect. I'm saying I wanted it to be twice as tall than it is wide. Well, we have default values for fig size, which is something like 6.5 by 5.5 or something like that. I can't remember the exact values. Um, this is actually a new one. It's not uh, on top of that one you were Yeah. So because I call fig equal plot dot figure, that's a brand new figure. And so it forgot about the old one. Um, I have a maybe general question. Mm -hmm. I was always confused why I would call plot.show. So I would always think I would call show on the figure, not on, on plot. Do you, do you get the, the question? Maybe it's a general API question of, of Matplotlib. So you call plot.show when you actually want a figure window to appear. It would do all of them. Uh, all the so you can make multiple figures ahead of time. Nothing will show until you tell it to show. Unless you have ion, unless you call plot.ion, which is, makes it like the MATLAB behavior. Um, and that's the reason why it's on plot, the show, because it's not a single figure. That the it's a global. Yeah, it, 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 so matplotlib keeps track of all the figures that were created. And then when you do plot.show, it all appears. Now, this leads into a very important point. Once you do that plot.show, execution stops when uh, interactivity mode is off, which is the default behavior for MATLAB, mat, mat, matplotlib. So you won't execute any more Python code. It's going to stop right at that plot.show. So if you have anything else after that, it's going to wait until all the figure windows are closed. By closing those figure windows, you have destroyed those figures. So you can make more figures after. But then the next time you call plot.show, only the new figures will appear. The old ones are gone. Real quick question. So mm -hmm. depending on him, if you call fig.show, does it only show the figure currently, or does it show all of them? Uh, so there, if I remember correctly, there is a fig.show um, that is limited to just that figure. However, things get a little dicey with that. Um, we, that's more of an advanced usage to okay. specifically do a particular show. Um, it does kind of mess up some things internally. So you but do it. 
yeah, do plot.show uh, to be safe. It's always safe to do that. Also, if you happen to be using a non-interactive backend, such as the ag backend, plot.show is basically a no-op. And it's not a blocking call, so it'll just keep going. So it's perfectly safe to call plot.show when you don't even when you're in a non-interactive backend, which you know you might run into, let's say, if you're running your code on a headless server or something like that. So again, that's one of the beauties of matplotlib is that uh, it doesn't. I mean, it's the same code. I mean, this code here, fig equals plot.figure, the add subplot, set all that. That's going to work on Windows, on Linux, on a Mac. It's going to work on your web server. It's going to work on uh, your Jupyter notebooks. It doesn't matter which uh, GUI toolkit you're using, any of that. It will work. Okay. And that's one of the beauties of matplotlib is that you guys don't have to care about it. You, know, you just want that figure to show up. You just want that figure to produce those PNGs and things like that which we'll get into how to make the PNGs later. Um, you don't care about all that detail, but you also don't want those details to impact your code. So you don't want to have to write an if statement, oh, if I'm, being, uh, if I'm using a QT, I have to remember to size this thing this way, and I have to remember to do this and that if I'm in WEX or something like that. Or, or that if you're in a, you know, a JavaScript uh, environment like Jupyter Notebooks. You don't care about a single bit of that. You just want to plot your data. You're the scientist. We recognize that. You want to get to where, where you want to go. You don't want to you don't want to worry about those details. That's the power of matplotlib. So um, we have that call to set. So you were able to, in this way, you were able to say axe.set xlim, ylim title. This is a nifty little feature of um, objects such as axes objects. Um, you could have also have done the same exact thing by saying ax.setxlim, ax.setylim, ax.settitle, ax.setylabel. So you kind of see the pattern here. Could have done the same exact thing. Would have ended up with the same exact result. Uh, it didn't show it below here because it still had a reference to it up here. And so notice that here, I the, la the label here got uh, a different example axis title, y axis changed, x axis changed. So it's different from what was set up here. This figure window got updated. Nifty. Um, that's something that you can do in normal Python environment if you have a uh, plot.ion uh, turned on, or if you do some other more advanced stuff, uh, or you can do it this way in the Jupyter Notebook, because I'm not closing any of these figures, so those figures aren't destroyed, so. Uh, can I, why is it updating the one that is, is, is that right. right, because notice I did not create a brand new figure, and I did not create a brand new axis. So axe.setxlim, the Jupyter Notebook remembered the axis object I created over here. Above. But you did call plot.show again, right? I called plot.show, yeah. And so under normal Python uh, scripts and stuff like that, once you call plot.show, it is a blocking call, and you wouldn't be able to execute any more Python after it. Because this is a Jupyter notebook, that concept kind of breaks a little bit. So you can actually execute more code afterwards. And so now I'm modifying the existing axes that I had already showed. So that's why that's happening. This is something you could only do in a Jupyter Notebook or if you have uh, the interactive mode turned on, so ION as opposed to IOTH. So it's usually a distinction you don't have to worry about. Usually you prepare everything ahead of time and your plot dot show is your, like your last thing you do. So most of the time, I would say 95% of the time, that's what happens. So you don't have to worry about this most of the time, but know that you could. All right. Um, so why would you use uh, this particular interface, the act.setxlim, act.setxylim, or in particular act.setTitle? Because in this form, you could have, uh, it can take additional arguments. 
such as the font name or title size or things like that. You can't do that um, up in this nice concise form. So this is useful for the quick and dirty. You know, it, I, I don't need to control every single little detail or things like that. Whereas the more explicit form lets you have more power. So both, both of them are perfectly valid. They're just good for different uses. Okay. So yeah, here, here's one that acts dot set x label sum label comma size equal 25. You do that with the set x label form rather than the axe dot set. So, all right. This actually plots something. You guys are all champing at the bit, aren't you? Um, you know, get on with it. So here we're going to create a brand new figure, and we're going to do fig dot add subplot one one one, and we're going to plot some data. So x, so values at x one two three four, the y values are going to be ten twenty twenty five thirty, and I want this plot to be light blue because I feel like it, uh, and a line width of three. You don't have to specify all these things. We have default values for them, but you can. And then we're also going to do a scatter. Again, the first set of values are the x values. The second list are the y values. And then I could say that I want so a c. In this case, is the um, it's sort of the data parameter. So going to uh, you'll see what it does. Uh, one, two, three, five. And then also specify the kind of marker. Don't worry, we're going to go into more examples of this later. And I'm also going to set uh, x limits. And let's show that. Let's see, what does it actually produce what I say to produce? Yes, it does. Note that in that, in that case, I only gave it the x limits. I did not give it the y limits. And yet it still magically knew what limits to do. But, so there we have the, tri the triangles of different colors. And we have ourselves a nice thick light blue line from the plot call. So what this demonstrates is that you can compose your axes, just like in MATLAB, where you can say, I want to do a plot. I want to do I am show. I want to do all that. Oh, wait, no, you can't do that easily in MATLAB. That's one of the things I love with matplotlib. In MATLAB, the default is hold on, or hold off, right? It's, it's hold off. The default in matplotlib is hold on. So we hold on to each of your plot calls. In MATLAB, by default, every plotting call gets rid of the previous one, which is so annoying. So if you want to compose your thing, so let's say you want an image, so you do an IM show on it, but then on top you actually want to put some scatter points on it. That works. It does exactly what you expect it to do. All right. So you'll notice that I did a whole bunch of axe.plot, axe.scatter. Well, you, you're going to... Hmm? Where's your fourth scatter plot? Hmm? The points? It's those triangles. Yeah. The so the fourth right off the left. The limit is the it went out. Ah, okay. See, the X limit... Uh, went to 4.5, but the, um, oh wait, one, two, three, four. Oh, that's right, yeah, the first one. Wait, no, X limit went from 0 0.5 to 4.5, so it should have, oh, right, yeah, yeah, the first scatter point, right, I'm looking at the plot, the first scatter point is at 0 0.3, and so that's beyond the limit okay. that you specify here. So it's going to do exactly what you say, well, check this out. So the toolbar down here, the one that I haven't really been talking about, click on pan. Da-da. Magic. And then uh, the other feature of the toolbar is you can zoom in. OK. And then you can go back to the original view by hitting that home button. Yeah. Or you can go back to the previous view, go forward. Yeah. 
neat features. So the default is create a trend line or the trend line, the, the, the line. The, the, the that, line, yeah, yeah that, that was the plot call. And then the scatter created the triangles. So I'm going to give you an, an identical uh, set of calls, and you'll see this a lot. And this is going to feel more like MATLAB for those of you that want to feel comfortable with that. Um, plt.plot, plt.scatter, plt.xlim. Note, it's not set xlim. plt.show. This is going to feel more like MATLAB where in MATLAB, you didn't necessarily have to explicitly create a figure. If you just simply called plot, the figure was already made, the axes object was already made, all that stuff. So the GCF and the GCA, for those of you who come from MATLAB, that may be a bit familiar to you, those things are automatically made for you. The PyPlot interface follows that. And so you can have, uh, so you can uh, write up code that just simply calls basically the same thing, and it will assume a default figure. It will assume a default axis. Now, remember what happens when you make an assumption. You make an ass out of you and me, right? So this is useful for quick and dirty scripts. This is useful for working at a, uh, an interactive prompt or things like that, where you may only be dealing with a single figure. You may only be dealing with a single subplot. But if you start dealing with more subplots or multiple figures, this starts to break down. And so unless you're very careful, you could accidentally be plotting things on the wrong code. Or let's say you're writing a function. You really should be passing in the axes object that you're using. That way you're explicit. So remember, PEP20, the Zen of Python. Explicit, one of the entries, remember, if those of you aren't familiar, PEP20, well, PEPs are Python enhancement proposal, which is usually just various documentation or various features, things like that. PEP 20 in particular talks about the Zen of Python, which is 20 uh, useful uh, things to know about Python, of which only 19 were written. I didn't even get a chuckle on that. I didn't even do that joke. It was, it was Guido, all right? So, but one of the entries is explicit is better than implicit. So by saying axe.plot, axe.scatter, things like that, you're being explicit. You're saying, I want the scatter plot to be on this axis object. There's no confusion whatsoever. But if you say plot.scatter, and you have multiple axis objects that are in play, it's going to use whichever one was the last one that was used. But you don't know which one that is. Only matplotlib knows that. So some, that may or may not be something you want. But it's less code to write. So, People like it for the interactive uh, uh, prompts. So now that I'm talking about multiple axes, let's do multiple axes. Let's show you how to do that. So before I showed you uh, fig.add subplot, that's a bit outdated, but it, uh, it feels a lot like MATLAB, so a lot of people like it. Uh, we have this feature called plot.subplots with an S. There is plot.subplot with no S at the end that uh, behave more like uh, fig.add subplot. This is plot.subplots, and you say that you want two rows and two columns, you will get a figure object and a, um, it's actually a NumPy array of axes object that are uh, oriented in the way you specify. So this axes thing would actually be a two by two um, uh, array, so a two dimensional array that's sized at shape two, comma two. So let's take a look and see what that does. Look at that. Nifty. Note again, default uh, axes limits. Note that the ticks are automatically chosen. You didn't specify that. It all just shows up. So uh, it's useful to do everything in one fell swoop. Sometimes you don't want that. Sometimes you want to just add an axis object to a figure because you may be given just a figure already. You know, so both of them are perfectly valid. Let's show you how to use it. So here I'm creating uh, a new figure and two by two axes, two by two uh, subplots, uh, 
and I'm going to set the title on each of those four. And I'm also going to turn off the ticks just to uh, clean up the, uh, just to clean them up so that way it's less confusing. But note, I, if those of you who might have learned yesterday in the NumPy tutorial that axes.flat lets you go over each element of the axes object, or each element of the NumPy array, because that's what you get. So look at that. Upper left, upper right, lower left, lower right. Useful. And then if you don't give plot dot subplots any arguments, it behaves exactly like doing fig equals plot dot figure, ax equals fig dot add subplot one one one. So if you ever come across code that says that, you can replace it with a one liner fig equals ax plot dot subplots. And you might be going, well, isn't ax uh, a numpy array in that case? Um, technically, yes but it is what's known as a zero-dimensional NumPy array. So you can treat it just like a scalar. So you don't have to worry about indexing that. All right, so we're gonna do an exercise, quick little thing. I want you guys to recreate uh, this figure right here, where which is gonna be three rows of subplots. It's got a nice little, uh, 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 sinusoid there, and it's going to have three titles. I'm going to give you guys something a, a little bit to start with. I'm giving you the imports. This is just simply a make it, this would be as if you're doing your own independent script, so that's why I'm importing NumPy and Matplotlib here. I'm going to give you the data. So you have your cosines, you know, slightly shifted around. And I'm going to give you even the title. But I want you guys to create the figure and the three axes object and, uh, and plot the data appropriately. All right, so you guys got five minutes to do that. So, and uh, we'll see uh, how that goes. OK? Is Hannah here? Hmm? I'm sorry, what? I have a question. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, not for the whole audience. I'm just, I'm about done getting this, and I got a minor question. Is anyone else having a problem with uh, a, uh, getting a, an error message of library incompatibilities? No. OK. We seem to be having some people on Macs that are having this issue. Oh. We're not quite sure what's going on there. Um, I don't totally get it. Um, we're going to try to set up a collab uh, thing for you guys to follow along. Meanwhile, however, I can't just keep waiting here to get it all sorted out. So we're going to move ahead. Um, hopefully, we get this all sorted out. Uh, so, all right. All right. So. <clears throat> Let's take a look at the result that I have. Yes, I know the figure doesn't look exactly the same as up here. I forgot to update it. Uh, so older versions of Matplotlib, particularly version 1.5 and lower, um, they did not pad the plot area. So this is to answer your question. They did not, the older version did not pad the plot area. While newer versions, we do automatically pad the plot area a bit. So that way to make sure the entire plot is always visible. There's no clipping or anything like that. So what, what did we do here? Well, we did plot.subplots and rows equal three. And then we made a little for loop where we looped over the axes and looped over the data, y1, y2, y3, and we also looped over the names. So we had ax, y, and name available, and we did ax.plot, x, and y, which came from the for loop, and we just said color equals black. We didn't have to say black 
actually no you, the default is blue so yeah um and then if you want and then we we also notice we turned off the ticks you don't see the ticks here so then therefore we turned it off up here and we also set the title to the name that we that we got from the for loop and then we showed it pretty straightforward once you think about it could you show the code again mhm mm uh by the way to get the show to get the code um, you might have saw that there was that percent load exercises slash 1.1, all that. Well, you change exercises to solutions, and then you execute that, and it will replace it with the solution. So, all right, let's move on to the next thing, because we've got to get moving here. Yes. Um, so after driving that a few times, I saw now that it was set up. There's too many figures open, and Jupyter Lab didn't like it anymore. How do you close figures that it thinks are open? How do you deal with in Jupyter? Or, I don't know, in, in Well, so in Jupyter, uh, there is that um, stop button. It's re yeah, I know. Th this is something that a bunch of people argued for a few days over whether or not we should have an X for the, Ju for the figures that show up in the Jupyter Notebook or if we should have a pause button. <laughs> That's how you close a figure in Jupyter because in Jupyter you don't ever really actually close it in the sense that it goes away. The Jupyter Notebook, when you do that, it will save a static image to the Jupyter Notebook, but the object the matplotlib figure object is now gone. So that closes the figure for you as far as matplotlib is concerned. So, but then in a normal GUI setup or, or whatever, you just hit the X. Also, the, um, you, can, uh, you can sit, I believe you can do a plot.close and then in parentheses the fig object itself and that will uh, close things as well when you're in an interactive type setup. But again, most of the time you're, you're going to create your various figures ahead of time and close and then uh, uh, get rid of them or you can recycle your figure by clearing it first and then uh, reusing it. Uh, that's more advanced usage. Uh, you'll see examples of that in the gallery. All right, so kind of give you the taste of the um, overall idea, you have a figure, and a figure contains uh, one or more axes or subplots, and that is what contains the display, the plotting display, whatever it is that you want to show. But I haven't, and I talked to you a little bit about how you can set some of those properties, such as the titles, the limits, things like that and gave you a quick example of plots and scatter, but I didn't really get into them. Um, because that is what you really want, right? You want to be able to plot, you want to do an IM show, you want to do a P color, you want to do a stem plot or things like that. You, at the scientist, at the engineer or whatever, you know what it is that you want to display. Now we're going to talk about how what they are, and the many different kinds of uh, plotting stuff we have. Now, matplotlib comes with many, 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 many plotting functions, and I'm not going to cover them all here. We have it all documented online, uh, but I'm going to kind of talk about the overall, uh, the, the overall set that most people tend to use. So 1D uh, data series or points, things like that. We've mentioned these. It's the uh, plot for X and Y. And you could do lines, you could do various styles, and you can have markers for those lines, things like that. By the way, any of these pictures I'm going to show you, you can click on them, it will take you to the code that uh, it took to make them. You can do scatter, which is not quite the same. A lot of people like to think that scatter is plot without lines. No, you could use it that way but it's not really meant to be used that way. It is meant to be used as um, scaled markers or colored markers based upon some data value. So, um, 
So if you really want just simply to plot a bunch of markers without a line, then you just simply say axe.plot the data, and you'll say uh, line style equals, in quotes, none. Uh, that way it will not plot a line. Um, there are various efficiency reasons for that, and I'll explain that in another section later. All right, some other plot types. We have bar plots. We have bar, bar H. We can do bar plots with error bars in it. You can do uh, kind of like what I call the Manhattan plot. Uh, it kind of look like city blocks, whatever. It, you can do it. It, it works. Um, fill between, stack plots, things like that. Then you have 2D type data. So you have your IM shows. Uh, so they can be color map, which I will talk about a little bit, or uh, actual RGB, optionally A, for alpha uh, arrays, things like that. P color, P color mesh, they're color map 2D arrays. Um, a lot of people like to think that IM show and P color are basically interchangeable. They're not. Um, I'll go into a little bit more detail about that, but um, recognize that IM show is far more efficient, but it doesn't have the same flexibility as P color. So P color, you can do these fancy little grids and things like that. You can't do it in IM show, but IM show will plot a whole lot faster than P color. The other uh, difference is that um, the coordinates for IM show refers to the center of the pixel whereas the coordinates for P color are referred to the corner. And so if you try to put, uh, do like display the same data using IM show and P color and you put one in one subplot and one in the other subplot and you put them next to each other, one of them is gonna look shifted by half a pixel. Okay, so, and that's because of the various use cases for P color. I mean, the people who fight over this, it's, it's like the Crips and the Bloods, it's, <laughs> seriously. It's, it's crazy, but you do need to watch out for it because there are functions out there that think that they're giving you uh, coordinate corners while other functions think that you're giving it coordinate centers. And then there's contour, contour F, and then there's also C label for those contours. Um, again, click on that to see the example of how to do it, but they're all very uh, useful and typical things that one might do. If you have vector data, so stream plots or uh, wind fields and things like that, we have arrow, quiver, stream plot. Uh, if you have some statistical type data that you want to do, uh, we have a histogram, we have box plots, we have violin plots, um, all available. Uh, very, very flexible, and it interfaces very nicely in with NumPy, because NumPy has various uh, resampling type uh, st stuff for histograms and uh, stuff for box plots and things like that. So um, we have it all explained in the documentation for that. All right, let's try out a few of these. I'm going to try moving along here, um, and then we'll get into a break in a moment. Uh, so the bar plot. We're going to quickly do. So we're going to, uh, I'm going to just make some random data. I'm going to uh, make some X data. So this is just simply 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and get some random Y data. I'm going to create my uh, figure and uh, subplot. So two columns. So that means, but by default, it's one row. So it's going to be two subplots. I'm going to uh, make it be uh, twice as wide as it is tall using the big aspect. I'm going to call the bar uh, x, y for, um, for the vertical bars on the first axis and the second axis I'm going to call bar h which is the horizontal bar plot and we'll see what that uh, does. Hey, quick Is that, that equivalent to what? Like in MATLAB, you say P equals plot X comma Y. Is that like just a pointer to the plot itself, sort of? Or? 
Um, I can't remember. It's been about 10, 15 years since I've done MATLAB, so I actually can't honestly remember. Uh, maybe maybe uh, one of your fellow uh, uh, attendees here might be more familiar with MATLAB again could tell you. I actually honestly don't remember. Um, then uh, we're going to do this uh, little thing. Just, just uh, I'm going to create a horizontal line for the axes and a vertical line for the axes, just simply to help kind of give you a point of reference. Uh, and then we're going to show that. So see, we have ourselves our horizontal line here. Got to scroll. We have our uh, horizontal bar here with the vertical line. Same data, just simply oriented differently. All nice and good. All right. And it's all light blue, because I told it to. It's going to do as told. Um, and now, uh, also note in, the, in this situation, um, I did that vert bars equals the call to bar, and the horizontal bars equals the call to bar H. You don't have to do this most of the time, but I wanted to do, I, I wanted to show you guys that all these plotting functions return an object for you guys to use, or a list of objects for you guys to use if you want to do additional things. And I'm going to show you what you might want to do. So let's say I want any negative, um, any bars that are below zero to be a different color. Well, I can do my bar call and I save it to vert bars. And then I can loop over, because vert bars here is just a list of the individual bars. And I can loop over the vertical bars in the data and I can say, okay, if the height was less than zero, I'm gonna set the edge color to dark red. I'm gonna make the color of, of the bar itself salmon, because I can. Um, and I'm gonna set the line width for that edge to be three. Ta-da! Very, very useful, you know, in case you wanted to do that sort of coloring or whatever. How is the three manifest, the line width? How is what? You said you set the Oh, okay, yeah, so it gets back to, uh, I actually do need to update this example as well. In the older versions of Matplotlib, particularly version 1.5 and below, um, we by default had a different color edge, and so you could see the edge. So right, so right, I completely forgot about that. So the edge color. Um, that's right. Oh yeah, it's something weird. Yeah, there. That's right because the color is overriding some stuff. So here, let me. There we go. That's right. So if you specify, and we'll get into this a little later, if you specify just the word color, color is so generic, it will, it will, uh, it will clobber any other values referring to color, whereas you can say specifically the face color, specifically the edge color, line color, things like that, that then does that. And so when color shows up, in a, it, it just obliterates everything. Whether or not that behavior is a great thing or not, yeah, but it is the it is the behavior that it is. So, uh, so uh, fill between. Um, so we have just trying to move along here. So created a bunch of data, and we called fill between on it, and showed it. Um, you can also use fill between to go between two curves. So here I've created y1 as being a curve and y2 as being another curve. And then here's the mean value of that curve. Well, not the mean value, but some value that would be in between there. Um, I'm going to fill between x. Uh, for, for, for the domain of X, I'm going to fill between Y1 and Y2 and give it a color of yellow. And then I'm also going to plot that other function I made up here I'm on top of it. 
and ta-da. So I have a fill between that was between two linear functions. So you have that yellow wedge, and then you have that uh, cosine uh, in there as came from that plotting. If you plot them in different orders, would the line show up, or would it be behind? The Fantastic screen? question. That's what I love Jupyter Notebooks for. So you can try that out and see what happens. Now, so this is a little bit of a quirk, is that you didn't specify the Z order, and so we have it so that, so this fill between, it produces a polygon, and so we draw um, certain things after other things. So yes, you can specify Z orders, and so the default, there, there are default uh, Z orders for polygons and default Z orders for um, plots, but let's say I said Z order equals one, and then here Z order uh, equals two, it disappeared. But then if I flip it around, nifty. Um, so with the advent of pandas and x-ray and other tools like that, uh, any of you here played around with pandas or x-ray? No, okay. Uh, not, not a lot of you, but some of you have. Um, they all present to you a dictionary-like interface. It's not quite the same thing as a dictionary, but it's very, very similar. And what I mean by that is that uh, you can uh, access values inside of them based upon some string name. And so uh, you could have a single data object that has many, many uh, a single dictionary, a single data dictionary that may have many, many pieces of information, um, such as, let's say, latitudes and longitudes, and then uh, channel one, channel two, channel three, something like that. And you're working interactively, and you don't want to have to type out all that every single time. You just simply want to say, I want you to use this dictionary and grab the X data and channel one, the X data and channel two. Right, so you just want to be able to say that. So in this case here, I have a dictionary. It has an entry for X, has an entry for Y1, Y2, and mean. This is a dictionary. It looks at the same data that you saw up above, right there. I just simply put it in a dictionary. Then I can call between, and I look, I give it the name the string x, the string y1, the string y2, and I provide data object, data object. This is, you know, it may, may or may not be useful to you. Um, what uh, some people find it useful for is that, let's say you want to display a figure that had just x and y1. Okay, you did that, fine. Then you did, you then you know, press the up button at your interface and you just simply want to try Y2 now. Well, all you have to do is just change the string to Y2. You don't have to go and re, you know, grab a whole other variable or something like that. It might be useful in a few other contexts and things like that. So it's there for you to use uh, many, not all the plotting functions support this, but many of them do. All right, uh, so this is gonna be a, uh, an exercise where we'll also take a, uh, a 10 minute break as well, but um, we're gonna try to take some of the stuff we learned here and we're gonna make a, a, project, project, a prediction of uh, how your um, attitude for this class is gonna go over the next uh, few hours. Um, so, I'm, so if you can reproduce this, which is uh, the snarkiest, uh, snarkiest, snarkiness index, um, and then how long it's been since the class began, which I believe we already passed the 25 minute mark, so um, 
we're going, I'm, I'm going to give you guys some data to start with uh, that you guys can play with. What I like to see you guys try to do, I even give you guys the colors, is that um, try to call bar with the error bars, do the plot, and to do the fill between right there and see what you get. So 10 minutes, uh, you can work on this. You can go uh, grab a drink or something like that, uh, go to the bathroom or something, but uh, come back in 10 minutes. All right? All right, um, so I've loaded up the solution. Uh, so everything below here is all the new stuff here. Um, so here, obviously, we created our figure and axes. You know, the example here only has a single subplot, so a single axis object. We're going to first uh, do our plot, so the raw X and Y data, and we're going to give it the line color. That should have been pretty straightforward. And then we're going to do the bar plot with the uh, error bars. Okay, and so we have the, the X position, which was the, uh, the averaged out. Uh, it, it's the minimum, it, it's this whole regrouping thing, it's averaging and stuff like that, so don't worry. Um, but you know, we have to have it all be the same shape as everything else, so and you have the average value for the Y, so the, so the bars are all going to follow those grouped average uh, values. Um, and then uh, we gave it a width, we gave it a color, and then the error bars, we gave it the uh, Y error, which I have already supplied to you. And E color, the edge color, uh, I'm sorry, E color is the error, the color for the error stuff. Then there's edge color. <laughs> I know, it's totally clear, isn't it? Um, we're making that gray. Yeah, we're gonna make both of them gray, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, fill between, we have the X pred, the Y min pred uh, prediction, and the Y max prediction, uh, so you have your bounds for your fill between, and we're going to give it a color, and we're going to set the title and Y and X label, and we should then produce that wonderful plot. I wonder if this is measuring my snarkiness, snarkiness level. Hmm. We'll see. We'll see if it matches up. Okay. Any questions on that? Was there anything really confusing, or you're just giving up and just going along with the flow? Okay. A simple mm -hmm. question. So, uh, if I wanted to grab this uh, the solution outside of uh, Jupiter, are they in the uh, download that we have? Oh, never mind. I see. The, it's all in the repository. There is a directory called Solutions. Very good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Next, image data. This is the part that I like. I tend to deal with a lot of image data. I'm a meteorologist by training, so I'm dealing with a lot of temperature data, uh, satellite data, and stuff like that. So I'm, I'm usually not dealing with one-dimensional data. I'm dealing with two, three, four-dimensional data. So um, this is sort of my bread and butter here. It's quick. So we've got the IM shows and the P colors. Um, I have a question. Hmm? Um, so something that confused me was um, on the example for the, the first bar chart that you created. Mm -hmm. um, you assign, you created like bar bars and horizontal bars, and you assign, you assign that to that uh, variable. Um, it's way on, on the top. You talk about the bar? The bar? No, in that one it's clear, but it's, uh, if you scroll up, uh, more, more. It's the first bar chart that you create. You talk about these things? No, no, more, more. More, more. It's the first bar chart that you created. Perfect. For this stuff? No. Or Mm -hmm. You put that into uh, that variable bar. Uh, verb the, bar. the vert bars? Um, yeah, so what is happening there is because uh, in, the, in, the, in the last example, you, you just 
didn't need to assign that to a variable. Right. In this case, I assigned it to a variable because I was going to modify the, uh, these are called artists. So anything that's visible on a plot is called an artist. Heck, the, the plot itself is called an artist. Um, so you can modify after the fact any of its properties. And that's what this example was. And so every plotting function returns an artist or a list of artists of some sort. And so you can go in if you wanted to do special modifications to some of these artists. And that's what this example is about. You don't have to capture this thing. If you're not going to do any additional modification, you can just let it go. You don't have to save it to a variable. Does that make sense? Yeah. OK. So most of the time, plotting functions, you will not see them save anything. They're not going to bother because it's, you're not doing anything special. You're just plotting anything up. But if you want to go and modify something, which is what this example showed, you could do additional things on top of the standard plotting uh, methods. And then actually to go really further with that is that you can create plotting methods that uh, calls other plotting methods and will take those artist objects that you have, you go and futz around with them however you like, and then you return those artist objects to someone else can make another plotting function that builds on top of that if you want. All right, uh, so I am show, uh, P color, things like that. Um, we talked a little bit about the uh, coordinate centers versus coordinate corners. Um, but the other thing that's important about them is that, and this also includes the scatter function, is that, they're, that what they're dealing with is what's called a scalar mappable. And what that means is that based on some scalar value or array of scalar values, you can map that value to a color or to a, sh a size or some other property. And so that's called a scalar mappable in matplotlib. Most of the time, you're dealing with mapping uh, a value to a color. And, that's, and that sounds like a color map. And color map tends to be involved with color bars. And, you know, a color map walks into a bar and, the, and the, uh, orders a drink, and the bartender goes, why the long bar? Anyway. There's about two more hours of these bad jokes, so just hang on. So here, um, oh, and this is the part where, which if you did not do that conda install MPL sample data thing, this is going to break. <laughs> um, it's not the end of the world. It's just simply some uh, some data just to show uh, some things. So I'm going to grab some data that comes from here. It's just a bivariate normal function um, that's slightly offset, things like that. Um, I'm going to, and so all that is is just a 2D uh, array of values. Um, and I'm not going to, I'm just going to do an IM show and I'm going to want a color bar based off of that. And so this is just one way to do a color bar. There's actually a few different ways to do it. I'm going to take that IM object, that, that image object that comes from IM show, and I'm going to give it to the figure, I'm going to say, hey, make a color bar based off of this scalar mappable that I have and display it for me. And I'm going to specify a color map, a C map, color map of uh, just Earth, because why not? Um, there's a whole bunch of them. We'll get into co uh, color maps shortly. Um, so note that uh, for IM show, uh, zero at the top, 14 at the bottom, so it's inverted. It follows a lot of conventions with uh, um, a lot of image analyses uh, type uh, systems. Um, don't blame me for that. It's, that's just the way it is. Um, and also these, uh, these axes limits refer to the pixel number, so this was a 15 by 15 array 
uh, so the limits went from zero to 14, and uh, it has a color map associated with it. Values go from uh, more than 1.0 to uh, less than negative 1.5. But you got the color bar there, and that was uh, pretty straightforward to do. You're just simply plotting out that data, and you told it to do the color bar. If, if I did not uh, tell it to do the color bar, no color bar, right? You told it to do the color bar, it gave you a color bar. Um, note, note that you call color bar on the figure object. You don't call it on the axes object. Because the way how color bars work in matplotlib is that um, when you, you tell the figure, I want a color bar, it's going to steal a little bit of space from the existing um, axes object, or actually technically the current axes. It's going to steal that space and, uh, and uh, allocate it to this new color bar object. So. So yeah, so you'll notice it, it's this wide in this case, but then if you do the color bar, now the width of that uh, image has actually been reduced a little bit, and now you have the color bar that there it stole the space from that color bar. Newer versions of matplotlib, um, actually it's been this way for a, a while now, uh, probably since about version 1.3 or something like that, um, you can actually specify exactly which axis objects you want to steal the space from, and it will uh, do its best to do that. Um, this is useful, so if you have, let's say, uh, three images in a row, by default, if you don't specify um, which, uh, which axes to steal space from, it's going to steal space from the last one. And so you'll have two images that are the same size and then one image that's slightly smaller and then the color bar next to that. And so, but if you can tell it, I want you to do, I want you to steal space from all three, it'll steal a little bit of space from all three and allocate it to the color bar. Does that make sense? Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. So by default, the origin for an IM show is in the upper uh, left-hand corner. Okay. okay. You can, s and then if you just if you flip the data, it's still the origin is in the upper corner. It's just, just that you passed it in a flipped data. Um, but you can say. Origin equals lower, there, origin's now in the lower left-hand corner, and the 14's at the top, and the data's flipped around. And then uh, there's other, if you read the documentation for IM show, you'll see, you can, you can specify the extent <laughs> of your, uh, of your image, uh, so that way it knows that, oh, so let's say you had latitudes and longitudes, for example. So you're not, you don't want the, uh, the limits to be referring to pixel coordinates. You want them to refer to uh, uh, some other type of coordinates. You can specify the extent of your image so that way the uh, limits uh, make sense to you. Uh, but if you read the documentation on that, I'm not going to go into that right now. Um, so uh, there's another thing. You can manually create the axes uh, where you want the uh, color bar to show up. So let's say you want the color bar to be on top of your ply. I've seen people do this. I honestly don't know why they do this, but they do it. Um, so they want the color bar to actually be in the subplot area. Well, you can manually do that. You can use this fig.addAxes, which is that method I mentioned earlier that you'll never, ever, ever use. Yeah, you do use it sometimes. And so you specify the extent of the uh, axes object in a uh, fractional figure space. Um, you have to look up the documentation. It's, uh, did I specify with the order of it? I, I don't remember. Um, but it's like the left 
the, the left, right, top, bottom, and the fractional, so between zero and one, so it's that spot in the figure that it will use up. And then you'll, and, uh, you'll also go ahead and do your normal IM show, but then for color bar, you say C ax, and so you're saying the color bar axes that you're going to use will be the one that you created up here. If you don't specify it, it steals that space. So if you don't want it to steal, steal space, and you want to have total control over that, you can specify what axes you want your color bar to show up in. And heck, you can even then say that it's going to be a horizontal color bar, and it will put the labels and the ticks in the right place. So if you wanted to do that, that's how you do it. And then um, in part six, if we get to it, I'll explain to you axis grid, which uh, you can it'll go ahead and pre-allocate stuff for you and it gives you more control over certain things. So, um, so other things for scalar mappables, uh, you're going to want to be able to define which color map you want, uh, the minimum. So if you don't specify a color map, it's going to use the default, which is the wonderful Veritas. Uh, for since version uh, 2.0, uh, it's been Veritas, which is a fantastic color map. Uh, before that, it was Jet, which um, has been scientifically proven to cause harm, harm to your family members. <laughs> you think I'm kidding. Mm -hmm. There was a medical study found that people, uh, uh, that uh, uh, technicians were misdiagnosing people because the Jet color map was making them see gradients that didn't actually exist. I'm not kidding. So it will harm your family members if you use JET. So uh, Veritas is much, much uh, more sane of a color map to use. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about color maps uh, later. But uh, you can specify which color map you want. Um, you can specify Vmin and Vmax. <coughs> one or the other. If you don't, then it's going to look at the data that you provide it and do an assumed Vmin and Vmax uh, to normalize over. And then you can, by default, it's going to assume that you're talking about a linear normalization. So it will take a look at the min and max and just do a straight out normalize between zero and one. Um, for scalar mapping, you could instead maybe you know that the data is going to be logarithmic, and, but you don't want to log scale it yourself you could just simply say it's going to be a log norm or some power norm or something like that. You can specify those sort of things. I don't have examples of it here, but it's in the gallery. But the Vmin and Vmax is the one that most people end up using at some point. Um, so in this case, I'm going to use a different uh, color map, uh, seismic, same data. And let's take a look at what happens. You'll note that seismic color map, if you look at the color bar, in the middle of it, it has white. But the data for bivariate normal, for my sample data, is not centered. The range of it uh, is not centered around zero. So it took the default Vmin and Vmax, which was the extent of the data, the range of the data, and it uh, just simply assumed that and normalized it that way. Well, now because of that, the white isn't at zero, and so you get this kind of reddish hue well, that may not be what you want. So, what if I did the same exact thing, but I say Vmin, Vmax, negative two, and positive two? I force it to be centered around zero. Ta-da! This is also very useful if, let's say, you're plotting an animation of images where in which each image may have a slightly different range if you specify ahead of time that I want Vmin, Vmax to be between 0 and 80, now as you go through that sequence, every single image, is the, the color is going to mean the same thing at every single image. So it's useful for things like that. All right. Let's reproduce this figure here where in which we have three subplots. And we're going to spend five minutes on this. We have three subplots and... Um, I'm going to provide you the same ra random data. Is it, is it the same? No, there's three random data, different um, uh, magnitudes of that random data. You're going to have a horizontal color bar, and um, 
we'll see what we make. We're going to spend five minutes on this, and I provide you the data. Uh, you'll see plot.style.use classic uh, is an old, it's a thing if you did actually like the way how your plots look back before version 2.0, you could use that. I did that here just simply to show uh, that you can do it. Um, you don't need to have it. Um, but then uh, we're going to create subplots. We're going to do a tight layout and stuff. But I want you to do the IM shows and the color bar. And note that I even provide you a color bar axis. Mm. So let's spend five minutes on that, and we'll uh, move on from there. All right. So the solution to this was actually pretty straightforward. This was, this is all the new stuff right here. A for loop going over the axes because we got ourselves three subplots here. So we're going to go over the axes here, and we have ourselves a list of the data one, data two, data three, and we're going to do an IM show on each one of those. And we're going to specify the vmin and the vmax. Um, this actually is not necessary anymore. Interpolation equals nearest. Uh, that is now the default for matplotlib in version 2.0, since version 2.0. Uh, but however, because I said to use the classic mode earlier, it's going to do that. Um, so that gets you your three subplots. Then I want that color bar. Well, I only need one of those scalar mappables. I don't need all of them. So I just keep the last one. And then I specify that the uh, color bar axis is going to be the one that I created for you already. And then the orient orientation is going to be horizontal. And with that, you generate the image. Yeah, it, it comes out huge. That's because of the, uh, the, I think because it's, yeah, the fig aspect. So, <clears throat> any questions on this? I know it's exciting stuff. Yeah. I have fun. Like, I think my goal is very similar, but the image looks very different. Well, that doesn't look like pixels. Yeah, so mine looks a little bit different uh, if you uh, had the uh, if you had the, the classic dial, but if you specify the um, the color map, then it all. Or, well, actually, this is the Veritas. So, yeah, I really should update that part. Then I took that out. Okay, but you get the general idea that you created those three axes. At, at, and you did the IM shows on that, and you created your horizontal color bar, and that you shared the Vmin and the Vmax across all three of them. So it was all good. Okay. Um, so let's move on to part three. How to speak MPL. So, you learn what a figure is, what axes are. You've learned what the various plotting functions are. You know everything you need to know, right? 
Why are you still here? You know, it worked the first year I did this, and then someone, okay. Um, the so the issue is that you've seen hints of things in all these other examples where you saw me mess around with the line color, you saw me mess around with the color map, you saw me mess around with other things, but I didn't really get into the nitty gritty detail. I haven't talked about how you specify line styles, how you specify markers and things like that. There's a whole system. There's a, basically an entire vocabulary within matplotlib on how to specify all these things that I hadn't even gotten into. There's still a whole nother part of matplotlib that you have not even seen. And you, you just didn't, you start realizing just how much control you have for your plots and how much you can do. Just remember, keep in mind, all the stuff you've done so far, you haven't needed to specify a lot of things, and the plots look decent. You specify a thing here, you specify a color there, stuff like that, but most of everything looks great. You haven't needed to specify all your ticks, you haven't needed to specify all these other things. It all looks fine, and you know what? For most of your uses, you don't need to. But you, I remember I said that matplotlib is uh, not, you know, unhelpful. It's not going to be getting in your way, but it's also not going to keep you from doing the things you want to do. So if you want to control certain nitty gritty details, you can. First things first, and probably the most important thing is the colors. So we have many, many ways to specify colors. First things first, you can do the shorthand notation that uh, we borrow uh, from a lot of places, it's just the RGB for red, green, blue, CMYK for cyan, ma magenta, yellow, black, and then W for white. So you can say, for any place where you want to specify color, you can say the string black, or you can say the string K. They're the same. Pretty straightforward, easy. We also recognize 140 additional color names. They're the HTML, CSS color names, such as Burleywood and Chartreuse. I didn't take French, so I'm probably butchering that. But, um, but, and you can uh, look up what the full name, we recognize all of them. In addition to those 140 color names, if any of the color names contain the word gray in it, we also recognize the English spelling of gray as well. So if it's G-R-A-Y or G-R-E-Y, because I never keep them straight in my head, which one's which. So if you say light gray with an E or light gray with an A, they both work. You're welcome, all you British people. Is, is, yeah, is. I'm not British, but thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm just a bad speller. I, I, yeah, I, I'm just a terrible speller, so that's it. Um, and then for the, there's, well, uh, some time back there was this uh, famous uh, XKCD user survey thing where you tried to determine what colors people thought things were, and he then published that. So if you specify a color based on XKCD colon blue, it's, the, it's using the blue basically from that palette. So if you consider it that way, we have this palette concept. It's not fully developed yet in matplotlib, but it would follow a syntax of some name colon and then the official name. And you can then grab a blue color or a red color or a green color, or whatever, from that palette. And so it would be that version of it. We also, for those who are familiar with Tableau, uh, you, we have a palette for Tableau, so tab colon blue, tab colon orange, green, red. You can get that version of it as well. Um, so that's what it is. You can specify a string of a hex with or without the, uh, the hash sign. So a hex, for if you're an HTML old school person, you may be completely used to this. Uh, in hexadecimal, you can specify the R, the G, 
and the B channel. So this would be blue. And then we also now support, uh, as a version 2.0, uh, an optional uh, fourth channel for the transparency as well. Again, this is not something that most of you will run into, but you might run into it from time to time, and you can do that. Uh, different ways to specify gray. Um, you, can do, you can provide a floating point number between 0 and 1 as a string. We recognize this as a special representation. So 0.0, .0 or just simply 0 as a string would be black. Whereas one, so in other words, if you, if you use the float constructor on the string, that value you get back would be the thing between zero and one. Zero would be black, one would be white. Anything in between would be some variant of gray. Does that make sense? Sort of an obscure corner of Matplotlib, but some people like it. So, um, with version 2.0, we um, added, I'm sorry, with version 1.5, we added property cycles. Um, we've always had color cycles, we now have property cycles, but with that we went a step further and we started coming up with a system for referencing elements of a property cycle. Right now we only have color implemented. Um, so if you have a color cycle, which those of you from matplotlib, the default color cycle was uh, uh, blue, red, green, and then CMYK. Um, and, it, and if you call plot over and over, it utilizes that cycle. Uh, it went through if you didn't specify the color. We'll, we'll get into that a little later. Um, but here you can say, I want the first color of that cycle. So if you don't know what the color is, you just know that you want the first one of it. This, this might be for a situation where in which you're dealing with a schema of some sort where someone might be switching out the different um, color cycles or something like that, you, and you're writing up code that goes, I want the first one to be the first color, I want the second one to be the second color. There are various, various use cases for it. We can do the first 10 cycles uh, using this notation of a C and then a single digit number. RGBA, a optional. Uh, tuples, so rather than specifying the hex, you can specify a tuple of, of values between zero and one, and then uh, so three, three or four tuples. You can, uh, in some places, there's a list of tuples as well. Some places you can't do this, um, and then also there's the fun thing where in which some plotting functions accept an alpha argument, but if you specify an RGBA tuple, the alpha argument takes precedence over the alpha channel in your RGBA tuple. So it gets a little confusing sometimes. Uh, it's called the two truth problem. You've got two truths. And so if they conflict, you have to choose one or the other. So we chose the alpha argument. Uh, let's quickly do an example. Let's, um, let's just have fun, go freestyle. I'm not going to tell you what to do. I want you to uh, take this plotting thing, and if you notice right off the bat, by default, it's going to cycle through the colors, the default color cycle. I want you to modify this plotting command here so that it used different colors, a different sequence of colors instead. We'll just uh, do a quick few minutes thing. If you, don't, if you don't figure out, that's okay. We'll be going, we're going to be doing a pretty quick pace here uh, for the next few examples. Anybody stuck? Still working? Go ahead, raise your hand if, if you're still stuck. I'm going to assume that the other half of you are all just racing ahead and just trying to get out of this. Okay, so take a look to the plotting function. Uh, for those of you who come from the MATLAB background, you start going, hey, this looks a lot very familiar. This is 
one of the most dreaded banes of my existence. The plot, the call signature for plot is insane. There are professional companies that actually have poured money into trying to figure out how to interpret the plot call signature. Uh, PyCharm hates us, absolutely hates us because of the plot um, call signature because it's so flexible and you can do so many things with it and you can totally blame math, MATLAB for it. Um, so here, you see the original example I gave you, uh, TT, the f that would be the X and the Y for the first thing you're gonna plot. T and T squared, the second thing you're gonna plot. T, T cubed is the third thing you're gonna plot. And if you don't specify the colors or any other information with it, it's going to assume the default. And the default being here the, uh, the, the blue, red, and green from the uh, default color cycle. But just like you can in MATLAB, you can do a plot specification after the two XY values. So here I'm gonna say that I want the first one to be red. I want the second plot line to be cyan. And I want the third plot line to be a level of gray, the string 0.7. Note that you've, you, know, you have to do these things as strings uh, because of the, uh, the plot call signature. And with that, uh, mind you, I told you you could do anything you want. That's fine. But I, you know, that's what I did here. And we see we have red for the first one, cyan for the second plot line, and gray for the third one. Now let's uh, take this a step further with markers. Commonly, what you're going to do in matplotlib and plotting, also true with scatter, is you're going to define a marker of what things are going to look like. By the default, for plot, there are no markers, uh, but scatter, there obviously is a marker. We have a default marker for scatter. It's just a, uh, a circle. Um, but we have a whole specification system. A lot of it comes from MATLAB. Uh, we have a few additional ones. But so you could do a dot and that's supposedly a pixel point is not, but it's a small circle basically. Um, you could do an O for a circle, a plus sign for a plus sign, um, X for a cross, um, and then, so that's basically the plus sign, but oriented, uh, rotated 45 degrees. You can do an octagon, so that's a string of an eight. Uh, you can do square, so that's a, uh, an S. There's a whole bunch of them you can do. That's all available. Uh, some of these don't really quite make sense. They belong, they actually come from other parts of the code, but it's available. Uh, so like for the, uh, the tick left, tick right thing. That's actually what the tick markers are when you when you look along the axes, and you see that. But you can use them too if you wanted to. It's, it's, uh, in that case, it's actually the number zero, one, two, three, things like that. You can't use that when you call plot because plot expects a string. But in other places, you can. We also have the string none, which means nothing. We have the Python object none, which means use the default value, use the default. When I talk about defaults, we'll talk about it a little bit later. There is this whole RC param system where in which you can encode what you like it to be by default, like something to be by default. You can also do a space, a string with a space and a string, an empty string, and they also do the same thing as saying none as the string. So there may be cases where you want to do that. Don't get too hung up on this code. This is just simply to show you what it all looks like. So the point, circle, oxidon, octagon, vertical bar, carrot up, carrot down, the default in this case, thin diamond, pentagon, things like that. 
all available right there. It's all, this, this table here matches up with this table here, so if you wanted to uh, know which letter, it was, which string it was that did that, you can see. The color of the marker, uh, because I didn't specify it, it went with the color cycle. So the color cycle is implicit? It's implicit, yeah. It's, it's not specified here. I could have, so I could have said color equals uh, R. Now they're all red. So let's uh, try some markers. Just for fun, just a quick little thing, kind of like how I did before, where you can specify different colors. Why don't you specify different markers? In this case here, I gave you a little bit of space. I gave a, you know, a little blank area here. You can enter in different markers just for you to have fun with. And then uh, the other thing you can do with this is you can combine a color spec with a marker spec. So the marker spec comes first, and then a color spec comes all in the same string. You don't have to specify everything. You can specify one or the other, but uh, you can specify both together in one string. So again, this should be very, very familiar to people coming from the MATLAB back, background. I suspect IDL does something similar as well. I don't remember. Yeah, you you are limited uh, in these plot format. So you can override that by explicitly stating that the color equals burly wood, things like that. But then you can't do this notation where you can specify multiple plotting things in a single plot. So again, it's why, but you can easily bypass that by calling plot multiple times right. too. So it's just, you know, you know, six of one, half a dozen of the other, you can do it different ways, it's the same thing. All right, so for my particular example here, uh, I did yellow stars, so you see the asterisk and a Y, so yellow stars for the linear por portion. Then I did um, uh, um, uh, gosh, I'm thinking the wrong word. Uh, you know, that reddish one. <laughs> gosh, I'm blanking on the name. Um, octagons and then I'm doing square, green squares, so SG. And guess what you get? Yellow stars and the um, cyan, magenta, magenta, magenta um, octagons and green squares. All right, line styles. No, not Ryan styles, line styles. Um, it's gonna be a long tutorial. Um, so we have uh, line styles. I particularly like using line styles. So what, what, why do we use color in our plots? And that's to help distinguish things, right? So you, you know that you got, uh, this is your, uh, 
time series for temperatures from Philadelphia. This is your time series from temperatures from some other city and stuff. So you give them different colors so you can distinguish them. But how many of you have published in a uh, journal that did not do color? Yeah. Line styles are fantastic for getting around that problem. So you can do different line styles that you can uh, then d help distinguish which plot is which. And so we have a, a way to specify different line styles. So a, sing a single dash, a string that's a single dash is solid. Two dashes, is, well, dashed. This is not complicated, people. Um, then you have dash dot. So that's a dash and a period. And then you have dotted, which is a colon. And then you have the string none, not the Python none, the string none. And again, a, uh, a string that's just a space and a string that is empty, all three of those things draw nothing, so no line at all, okay? And then there's actually this whole other system for creating your own sequences, your own line uh, dashing patterns and stuff. I'm not going to get into that. It exists. Uh, it's uh, an interesting API that some people have utilized, but this should get you through most of your needs, those four different styles. One thing I want to point out, that when you're doing this in, um, when, you call, when you're trying to specify your line styles, Watch out for dot dash and dash dot. Two completely different things. If you did dot dash in a plot call, you're going to get um, a solid line using the point marker. But if you did in a plot call dash dot, dash dot, you're going to have a dash dot line with no markers. So they're two completely different things. So that's something that I mix up. Obviously, I just mix it up in my head right now. It, it's a very common tri tripping point. They are two very different things. Question? Yes. What's, what's the use case of draw nothing nouns? Ah, very good. So oftentimes, so, and, and, and I'm going to cover this uh, later in the artist section, but we implement plot and scatter very differently. With plot, the assumption is that the artist has all identical markers. With scatter, you can't make that assumption. So with plot, there's an optimization in which uh, we can reuse the same marker over and over when we render. Scatter, you can't do that. And so if you're going to plot something that has many, 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 many points, and you don't want the line, but you also want the markers to all be identical, you would use plot with a draw, with a line style of none, a uh, string none, or empty string or whatever, so that you don't get the line, you only get the markers, and it's highly optimized. And so it renders very, very quickly. If you want all the markers to be identical, if you don't want the markers to be identical, you want them all to have different colors, you want them all to have different sizes or something, then yes, you have to use scatter. Fantastic question. Any other questions? So let's play with the, with the line styles a bit. So again, we're going to go back into the plot uh, uh, call signature again. I want you to uh, do a few different line styles with a few different markers and a few different colors, all under the same Oh, I'm sorry, this is not an example. I already made this one. Um, so here we have four plots here, each one of them with a different style involved. One nice feature that came about in uh, Matplotlib 2.0 and later um, is this. The line width equals, let's, let's give it a ridiculous line width, 10. The spacing for the, for, the, for the pattern scales with the line width. Back before version 2.0, if I specified a line width of 10, each of those uh, dashes 
would have the same amount of white space in between them and the same length of the dash regardless of what the line width was. And it looks terrible. Now, the uh, spacing of all this stuff scales with the line width, so it actually looks pretty neat. And you can combine the color uh, architecture from the last run with this as well. So in this particular case, the, the uh, colors were not specified. Right, you can specify them the same manner by sticking a, a color letter on the end of the Yes, you can. Yeah. Oh, uh, this little point that I make here, that the line styles mentioned above are only valid for lines. Whenever you're dealing with line styles at the edge of patch objects, you will need to use words instead of the symbol. So it's solid instead of dash, dash dot instead of, uh, well, a dash dot. Um, version 2.1, we fixed that. Uh, it, so it used to be that, um, that you had, so, so if you said, for a bar plot, since bars use patches, not uh, not polygons or whatever, or uh, not line 2D, then uh, for bar, you couldn't say um, dash dash. You couldn't do this before. Now you can, if you have version 2.1 and greater. So now you can use them interchangeably uh, for the most part. So wherever you're dealing with line 2D or patch objects, you can say one or the other, it doesn't matter. So yeah, so this table up here, you know, solid, dash, dash, dot, both these strings are valid strings to use. Obviously not the word draw nothing, That's, it doesn't recognize draw nothing, but. All right, so let's put, and I did this example here Okay, plot attributes. Let's um, play around a little bit here. Red dashes, blue squares, and green triangles. So here I said red uh, dash dash B uh, S. Uh, so blue squares, uh, not certain brown things. Um, and then green. Uh, tr uh, and then the carrot, so G, carrot, and that's the green triangles. And so you get that. So now you can see how powerful the system is within the plot specification. Now you can't do this sort of stuff in, let's say, scatter. And you can't do this in some of the other parts of the API, but you can do that here in plot. Other uh, properties that you can mess around with you do as a keyword arguments, you can specify the alpha. You can say color or C as a keyword argument. Dash cap style, so um, when dealing with um, lines and they uh, go around a cor cor you know, the corner and stuff, uh, they can have cap styles and join styles that would uh, be mitered or bevel be beveled, things like that. Um, the features aren't perfectly there, uh, some places it works, some places it doesn't, but uh, most people don't need to deal with that. Um, but in particular, that's uh, needed for when you're doing dash type plots. So that way the, um, uh, the dashes look right. Um, specify, again, the dashes. So that's the API if you want to do the more advanced type of uh, inking um, sequences. Draw style. So default is, so what draw style? So any of you, anybody here does finance? Okay, so stock market plots, sometimes uh, you'll have it quantized based on what time. So you, you don't have, so the lines are only horizontal or vertical when you plot it. Kind of look kind of like a bar plot, but not quite. You can do steps and step pre and step mid and step post. So steps is step mid. It's just that was the old way to say it. Now we're more explicit. We could say steps pre. So it means, uh, so when it does the step function and you say that the value is going to be at x1, y5, the stepping would happen either before that point 
at the middle for that point or after that point. So step pre, step mid, step post. Um, most people don't need to deal with this, but some people want that, and that's the draw style. Line style, or LS, we covered that. Line width, or LW, uh, the float, floating point value or integer between zero and however large you want it. Uh, the units are in points, so draw points um, is some unit of measure. Uh, the different kinds of markers, so you can specify that as a keyword argument. Marker edge color, or MEC. Marker edge width, or MEW. Marker edge color, or M, uh, marker face color, or uh, MFC. So think about the marker itself. Some of these markers are filled markers, so the square, circle, um, things like that. They have a face to them. You can specify the color of just the face. Meanwhile, uh, things like the cross and the plus things like that, they don't have a face, they have an edge only. But the filled ones have both edge and face. Uh, there's cap styles and joint styles for solid lines as well. So I mentioned before the dash styles, there's also them for the solid ones. Again, that feature doesn't quite always work quite right. There's some examples of it in the gallery if you want to look at it, if you care whether some are going to be beveled or not, but it's there. You can also always specify whether or not it's going to be visible. Uh, this is the thing you might use. You go, well, I plotted it. I want it to be visible, right? Um, this is a feature you tend to use more with animations. So you might go ahead and just plot everything, but then the animation code will make things be uh, visible or not visible on demand, things like that. So you can change that. Or if you're going to do interactive type uh, application, which um, I uh, wrote the book on <coughs> interactive applications uh, using matplotlib. Uh, go ahead and buy it. Um, <laughs> uh, it's a fantastic book, uh, if I may say so myself. But um, so, uh, I mean, the author is just fantastic. He really should meet him. He's good. Um, so he, uh, with interactive applications, you may have something like where in which you do an action, and that might make something disappear and something else appear or things like that. That's what you might use the visible uh, feature, uh, the visible attribute for. And then Z order, which we touched on earlier, uh, by default, uh, different types of things have a certain predefined Z order. So you know, Tim tend to want plot lines to appear on top of bars and stuff like that. So we predefined a lot of other things. But if you want to override that, you can. You, you can specify your own Z order so that lower value stuff show up below, and higher z-order values show up above. So let's uh, do an exercise where I want you guys to create a dotted red line with large yellow diamond markers that have green edges. Okay, I give you guys the data, I give you guys part of the plot call, make that plot have a dotted red line and large yellow diamond markers with green edges. All right, so, you know, a red dotted line, so we do an R colon, so that gets you the red dotted line. And then the marker is going to be diamond, the large diamond. Remember, if we go back to the table, there were two diamonds in that table. There was thin diamond and uh, diamond. Oh, it was. Yeah, thin diamond and diamond. So capital D is the big, large diamond. Oop. Overshot my landing. So 
So that gets us the markers there. And then we need to define some colors for the markers. Uh, because if you don't, the markers are going to get the same color as it was specified for the line. So we're going to say that the marker face color, because these are diamonds, they're going to be filled. We're going to say that they're going to be yellow. And the marker edge color, MEC, equals G for green. And there we go. So now you see how you can control all those little itty bitty parts to get the exact detail you need. Now, some of you are going to go like, when am I ever going to need a plot like this? Well, that's not the point. It's to demonstrate that you can control the individual features so that, you know, let's say you wanted, let's say, uh, for example, you're plotting something on top of an I am show and your markers are disappearing into the background of the uh, I am show, so you want an outline for it. Well, now you know how you can add an outline to that marker by specifying the MEC, you know, the marker edge color, so that you can uh, do stuff like that. So there are circumstances where such things are needed. And then also now you know how to have different color marker than the plot line itself, things like that. Uh, there's another feature, I don't, I don't go into this here in the documentation, but um, for, uh, there's um, mark every. So if you don't actually want, um, I, if you don't actually want, you know how it gets all crowded right here and everything, and maybe you don't actually want to marker at every single point here, um, you can say I want to mark every five data points or something like that, and you can do something like that. It's kind of neat. Uh, it's available. I don't, I don't remember exactly the, the uh, keyword argument there, whether it's mark underscore every or mark every one word. I, uh, but anyway, let's move on to color maps. The other very, very important thing in plotting, we, you know, we just talked about how to deal with the 1D you know, time series or other type of series type data, which you know, many of you might be using, you know, whether you're in finance or you're dealing with temperature data or, um, or whatever, what have you. But a lot of us also deal with image data, in which case you need a color map for. Or you might be doing your plot, scatter plots and you need to map values to a color for the marker. That's what the color maps are for. Color maps are extremely important to define. Don't take it lightly. Because how your brain perceives color and interprets color it's very important. Um, we do color maps uh, and utilize the color spectrum to denote our data because it actually expands. It gives us more uh, gradations to be able to understand our data as opposed to just simply doing a simple straight out grayscale from white to black. White to black, if you, uh, if you uh, imagine you know, the color space is like this really weird shaped thing, but white to black might be vertical, but meanwhile, the color uh, space is actually stretched out a bit horizontally. So if you can kind of map a bit through that color space, you can actually get more gradations and understand your data at a higher resolution, in a sense, per uh, perceptually. Uh, that's why we do color maps, and that's why we have colors. Before version 2.0, I mentioned this, that we're with the jet color map, uh, there was a fantastic talk um, at SciPy 2015. Um, I gave, I give the link right here. It's to a YouTube video for that. It explains why uh, jet is so bad. And it also explains and introduces the new default color map called Veritas. And, um, and it apparently comes from the Greek word for green, or maybe the Latin word for green, I don't remember, but um, the, uh, it's what's known as perceptually uniform. And so what it is is that it goes through the color space in such a way that it's not, that every step through there, perceptually your brain is gonna see it as the same amount. And so you're not gonna see gradients that don't actually exist. So. In jet, for example, you go from a, a yellow to red, 
or something like that, your brain sees that as a much uh, tighter gradient than, let's say, moving from blue to green, um, and so, and which the jet color map also does. And so if moving through that jet color map, you're going to see gradients and you're going to think that things are happening that aren't actually happening. And so your choice of color map is very, very important um, if you want uh, people to not die. So uh, don't worry too much about this bit of code here. I just put it in here. Um, it comes from our gallery, um, and it shows off the many, many, many different uh, color maps that we have, and kind of uh, organizes them a bit. So these are the perceptually uniform sequential color maps. So we have the Veritas, Plasma, Inferno, Magma. They all came, they were added in version 1.5, and Veritas was made default in version 2. We have the sequential color maps. So these are the simple uh, monochrome, you know, go from light to dark in a particular color. Or some of these are not monochrome, but, you know, they do orange to red, yellow, orange, red, things like that. These are not guaranteed to be perceptually uniform, but they're very, very close to being perceptually uniform. By the way, these names all match up with names you'll also find in MATLAB and IDL and stuff like that. Here's another set of sequential ones. Uh, binary is just another grayscale. Um, then you have some others, and then you have gray, that's reverse of binary. Pink, spring, summer, autumn, winter, because MATLAB had it. Um, I actually have no clue Wistia, came, I have no clue where that came from. Um, copper, hot, these are all different. Again, these are not guaranteed to be perceptually uniform, but they're pretty darn close. They weren't designed to be that way. Diverging color maps, these things are great for uh, doing anomalies, so values that are negative and positive, things like that, they're fantastic for doing that. Um, and like uh, the BWR is, I think, the Brewer ones. Uh, so comes uh, uh, anyone if anyone familiar with the Brewer Brewer uh, come from a professor, uh, Dr. Brewer. She did a whole analysis on color uh, analyses, so she came up with a bunch of more color maps. They're not in MATLAB. We have some qualitative ones. These are discrete. Um, so various tableaus. So tab 10, tab 20. So tab 10 means that there's 10 colors. Tab 20 means there's 20 colors from Tableau. Then you have the bad ones. Well, okay, they're not all bad. There's, some of them are just different. Um, I have no freaking clue what flag is ever meant for. It comes from MATLAB. I'm going to blame MATLAB for that. I don't know why anyone ever added flag in there, but it's there. Um, so if you're French or you're American, it works. Great. Um, prism, again, is another terrible one. I mean, I, no, these are utterly, I don't, the only time I ever used prism was when I needed a quick and dirty way to color a whole sequence of polygons, and I didn't know where the polygons would be, so I wanted, I wanted to increase the chance that neighboring ones weren't going to have the same color. <laughs> it, that's like the only time I've ever done it. Um, so um, you have your uh, HSV, which uh, the hue saturation value, just rainbows. It, and then there's the dreaded jet. Mind you, you know, I, we, we rag on jet, but jet's not the only one. It, the others are bad, too. But you see like, here, you're perceiving these deltas differently. So here you think that things are changing a lot more rapidly than it is over here. And that's not true. So that's just wrong. And so you can cause problems that way. Um, I, I'm guilty of using the GIST NCAR um, because it's very, very close to the official NEXTRAG color map for uh, radar 
images, so the radar images that you see on TV, that actually derives from the FAA uh, because people, people, uh, FAA, if you're, you're allowed to fly near things that were green, so low reflectivity values, you're supposed to stay away from the things that were yellow, or at least be very cautious. And then the things that were red, you weren't supposed to fly your plane anywhere close to that. So that they ended up coming up with something, a color map like that, and they ended up doing the next red maps that way, and it's terrible. You're not supposed to do that, but anyway. So... Um, Let's look at the same data, but done with two different color maps. So it's the same thing. So the first one was done using a grayscale, but the color one actually a lot more interesting to your eye. It's, it's interesting to see it that way. So, but mind you, one thing to remember when you do publications and you're going to publish in something that's going to do grayscale only, don't submit a colored uh, image. Submit it black and white. Submit it using a grayscale because if they were to convert this image that's here on the, le on the right, right into black and white, they're going to assume some sort of uh, saturate, you're going to use some sort of black-white conversion thing, which is probably going to look completely wrong. So you want it to, so basically you're trying to ask it's it's like uh, the pers it's like the ma the uh, publication is colorblind and so it's not going to map correctly so just do it correctly yourself when you submit it another fun thing here who here is a latex user or latex you can do mini latex in matplotlib so uh dollar sign backslash sigma i uh, sigma underscore i equals 15 dollar sign that looks like a little bit of latex to you doesn't it it looks like that little bit of math text that you might be so familiar with the thing to remember in python is that you need this r before the string what it means is it tells python to treat this as a raw string because if I didn't do that, there is no backslash s. And so in uh, Python 3.6 and later, uh, 3.6, it warns you on this. After 3.6, it will actually error and say that it's, this is not a valid uh, control sequence. Uh, the other reason why you want to do that is, let's say you did, let's say I take away that r and I do I do new. Well, it you see the dollar sign is up here, and then it went down to the next line because it saw the backslash n and saw it as a new line, <laughs> rather than, and then put it in a u. But then if you do the r. Oh, that's the Greek letter nu with a subscript of i equal 15. This is going to be something you're going to use a lot. Okay, so any, any place where you can specify some text, if you do the dollar sign, inside of there we will do a basic latex interpretation. Uh, it's our own little built-in parser. It's not a real latex parser. If you wanted to do real latex parsing, it's possible to trigger that. Um, but at least this will satisfy most of your needs. Hatches. This is nice. Um, this is another thing. So we talked about line styles as being the alternative to distinguishing data, uh, not using color. You know, in case you're putting, you're publishing in a black and white uh, publication or something like that, or you have an audience where in which you know there's going to be some colorblind people in there. Um, hatches is a is a way to deal with this problem when you're dealing with, let's say, bar plots and things like that. You can hatch instead of color your bars so that then uh, it's obvious which one you're doing. So we have this whole specification for hatches. 
Um, you can combine the letters to, ha to utilize multiple different kinds of hatches. You can repeat some of these characters to repeat, uh, to, to increase the density of it. <clears throat> so we'll, uh, I'll have an example of this in a moment. And then we get to what the feature I live, property cycles. So I added the property cycle feature in version 1.5. Um, before that, the only thing you could cycle was color. And it was explicitly a thing called the color cycle. I got rid of that because I wanted to cycle line styles. I wanted to cycle hatches because I was publishing in different places that they weren't publishing colors. They wanted it and stuff. And I, didn't, I just wanted to be able to cycle the same way as I could with color. So I created this thing called the property cycles. It's not like the property brothers. It's... It's not even a chunk. I'm really doing terrible. Um, so here, we're going to define a property cycle uh, that's going to cycle through R, G, and C, so red, green, and cyan. And it's going to cycle through line width of 1, 4, and 6. And it's going to cycle through line styles of a solid, a dash, dot, and a dotted, so note three values. So I'm gonna have three lines, and it's gonna be thin red, thicker green, even thicker cyan, of the different line styles. These are using what's called these cycler objects. So they're uh, pretty cool. Um, so here I'm gonna do three plottings. And so each one of these is gonna be if I, had, if I did not define the property cycle, it would use the default property cycle. So the first one would come out blue, the second one would have been green, and the third one would have been, uh, uh, the second one would have been red, the third one would have been green. That's the default color cycle, and they all would have been solid. And they all would have had the same line width. But now I can define a property cycle, and it's gonna iterate through those three properties There we go. Solid, dash dot, and dotted in red, green, and cyan, and different uh, line width. So, and you can do this with hatches for bars and stuff like that. It works great. So, we're gonna do a little bit of a break, but also an ugly tie contest. So I have provided data in the form of X and Y that forms the shape of um, a, what kind of looks like a tie, okay? Trust me on this. Um, and then we're gonna call plot.fill, and we're gonna cycle through different colors and different hatches. So you see here, so red, orange, cyan, yellow, okay? That makes sense. Hatches, I'm gonna do the X hatches, I'm gonna do XX dash. So XX dash, if you go up here, is that you have the cross diagonal. Having two of them means it's more dense. And then dash, there could be horizontal hatching as well. And we're gonna have um, plus an O, and dot and stuff, so you can mix and match these different hatch specifications. You can repeat them and stuff for more density, things like that. And, and, and what I want you guys to do is we're gonna take a break as well, but go ahead and play around with this and you can uh, muck about with uh, these specifications. So here I could do a, uh, a, a little O and rerun this. And look, I got little circles now in there, and in that first, in that red tie. But then if, yeah, I know, it's warning me about having so many figures open, I know. Um, but let's say I increase the number of O's. The more O's you put in, or the more of anything, the higher the density of that hatching is. So we're gonna take a break. So if you feel feisty or whatever, go ahead and make some ugly ties and then uh, post it on Slack, on the Slack channel. And we'll laugh at them or something because they're funny ties.
Hmm? Fantastic looking ties. And I see someone here uh, figured out how to uh, increase the number of ties because you can never have too many ugly ties. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> ah, yeah. What happened to that image? <laughs> Windows snipping tool. Oh. Okay. All right. Ooh, and I see my popularity increase doubled. Before it was like 30 members of this group when I started, so I, I'm really uh, winning here. Ooh, I like that one. That that's a good one. That one reminds me like the Sears Tower or something. You just okay. We got a lot more to do, so and uh, very little time to do it. So, okay. Um, I'm going to talk about a quick little concept here uh, that's rather complicated. I'm going to preface this with: you most likely will not need to deal with this, but it's important to know that it, it exists, and this is the thing that makes Matplotlib work. Besides the whole back-end system, we have this transform system. And you may not have thought about this much, but when you look at these plots here, and I zoom in. Yes, I know there's a bug. We're going to have to talk to the uh, Jupiter people. Um, but I zoom in. And the size of these things didn't change. They're still the same line width. They're still spaced the same way. I zoomed in, but it's still the same. Magic. Um, meanwhile, you know, it's still going to place everything in the right place. It's still going to put things in the right place. Uh, later, we're going to have an example where there's a legend. And no matter where you pan and stuff like that, that legend stays in the same place. And when I pan around, uh, when I pan around my grid, you know the numbers all move around for the tick labels, but yet other things stay in place. It's the transform system. There's this whole system where we have this hier hierarchy of transforms. We have the transform for the figure. We have the transform for the axes object. We have the transform for um, the data. We have a transform for, and, and we have inverses of those things as well. And, and then we also have them as separable uh, transforms. So some things uh, may, so no matter how much I pan around uh, this stuff up and down, these uh, X tick labels don't move up and down, but they do move side to side. And then it's separable uh, for the Y tick labels because as I move up and down, they move. But if I move left to right, they don't move. It's all part of the transform system. It exists, and it's for that purpose. And so some things uh, you may find that you need to use it in some places. Um, most of the time, you shouldn't. But if you need some things like where you want to be able to zoom in on something and that there's a circle there and you don't want that circle to move. You can do that uh, with the transform system. You can do various, if you want things to behave differently, you want them to be placed differently and you want them to behave differently to the interface system, there is this whole transform system that you can work with, you can define and you can do much more advanced stuff and it's also how the, uh, this thing is able to do everything it's able to do in the first place. The other thing I'm going to talk about, and we're not going to get into too much detail, but I'm going to let you know that it exists. It's called the Matplotlib RC. It's the whole RC system. Don't ask me why we call it RC. Apparently, it comes from 
the name, name of some config system, some old program like 30 years ago. I, I'd never even heard of it, but apparently everyone calls config systems RC for some reason. I don't know, I'm not old enough for that. So, um, so we call this the matplotlibrc. There's actually a matplotlibrc file that gets created when you first time use matplotlib and gets put in a place. Um, and it's different for different OSs. To find out where yours is, you import matplotlib and you'll print matplotlib matplotlib underscore f name, and that will get you the name of your RC file. And that's right here. And you almost never need to actually edit this thing. Uh, or you can even have your own copy that has your own entries. And these are all the default values that are used. So remember how I said that you didn't need to specify your line width. You didn't need to specify your color cycle. You didn't need to specify this or this or that. That's because it's all in the RC file. You can override any of it. And you can even define your own RC file so that way it's your default every single time you use it. We even have some RC files packaged with matplotlib uh, that follow various styles. Um, we're also inviting people to uh, submit uh, styles that conform to different um, publishing uh, house. So if you have one that's for um, the IEE, IEEE, or uh, if you have one that conform to publication from AGU or things like that, we would actually would love to have a style sheet that's for that so that way someone could say, you know, matplotlib.use AGU. And now all your plots are going to follow the AGU style specification. So it will have the right font, so it will have the right sizes, so it will have all the right colors and things like that. Wouldn't that be wonderful? We have this system in place. We're still working on making it better, but it's the functionality is there, and it's through this RC system. Um, there's also this function here called MPL RC defaults. What it does is it resets all any changes you've made. It resets it back to what it was when it started. So here we're going to do a quick little example. I'm going to run this thing a couple couple times. That's why I have the RC default. Um, I'm going to mess around with uh, the line width and line styles. I'm going to mess around. Um, and, and you'll see what will happen. So the line width uh, is two, line style is dash dot. So I first did a plot, a regular plot, so it's going to use the default uh, style. Then I mess around with the RC things, and then I did the same exact plot call, but to the second axis. And it's going to have a different style. It's going to look different. It's the same plot call. I didn't specify line width in here. I didn't specify line style. But I specified it in the RC. So you, you can either do this programmatically within your program, or you can have the RC file that's sitting in your home directory or something like that. And so it will be picked up every single time you use it. So it's all there, ready for you to use. Um, we have documentation that explains it a lot more. Um, so customizing matplotlib, so you can learn how to do that. You can also learn how to uh, invoke your own styles, invoke uh, prepackaged styles that exist as well. OK? So I'm going to move on here. It, now you know that this thing exists. Um, it's, something you can really get yourself in the weeds on, but it exists and it's there to use. Okay. We got a Zoom. We got 45 minutes left. Part four. Limits, legends, and layouts. Oh my. So we've talked about what makes an axis and figure and stuff, and we talked about that hierarchy. You have figures. A figure can hold one or more axes, and then an axes object or a subplot can have multiple axes, and you do your drawings in there. You can, ha And then we talked about what sort of plotting you can do inside those subplots. We talked about how to modify the properties and modify, uh, 
you know, colors and line styles. We talk about the vocabulary, the, the language of matplotlib, so edge colors and line widths and all these sort of stuff. Talked about all this stuff. There's still a few more things that we have not talked about. We have not talked about legends. We did color bars, which is one way to annotate your stuff, but we have legends as well. Uh, we also have limits. How do you specify your, uh, what range your domain and your uh, uh, Y and X limits should be? Are there different ways to specifying limits? And then how can you lay out your uh, subplots in, in weird and funky ways? First, we're going to talk about the limits. So you may have noticed this. We actually did touch on this a little bit earlier where we saw that padding that didn't exist in my example photo. That was because we, uh, auto, the, uh, that's basically the auto scaling and the automatic padding that now occurs that wasn't always there in the past. So for plots and scatter, there is a default margin that we apply. So if you don't specify your X and Y limits, we're one, gonna figure out what the X and Y limits should be based upon the data you've given it. Two, we're going to figure out how much we're going to pad based upon whether or not you did a plot or scatter or if you did an image like a contour or, um, or an IM show. So in this case here, we're going to do a plot or scatter and we give it a bunch of data. Notice we're not going to specify here the X and Y limits. Okay? And for, for those of you who might get a little confused, this is the automatic unpacking. So I'm calling subplots and creating two axes objects. So it would have been a NumPy array of two elements. This would have unpacked it to two axes objects right there. So here am I calling X or Y limbs. It's going to figure out for me what those limits should be. Again, it's uh, scaling this thing way more than it should. But so it figured out what the X and Y limits should be, and it even padded it a little bit so that way the lines and the dots don't go right up against the edge of our box, our plot area. Why am I pointing at the screen? <laughs> I just realized that. You guys can't see my screen. You only see it up here. I wonder how long I've been doing that. Um, but, so you have this little bit of gap here. So by default, we apply a bit of a margin so that way uh, these things don't run up against the edge of your bounding box. Uh, but, and so if you don't specify your X and Y limits, that's what happens. But you can specify, you can, let's say you still don't want to specify your X and Y limits, but you know that you want more padding or less padding. You can specify what the margins are gonna be. So here we're going to say we want no margin for X, but a 10% margin for Y for the first axis. But the second axis, I want uh, across the board 5% both X and Y. There we go. No padding in the X direction for the first axis, but there is a 10% padding in the Y direction there in that first axis. And then if we scroll over here, we see 5% padding here. So I still did not specify X and Y limit. So that's the beauty of it, that this is really great for automations and stuff that you don't need to know ahead of time what the, what the X and Y limit is, or you don't have to do mp.min and mp.max on the data first. We'll figure it all out for you. Um, you can, another way of specifying the X and Y limits is through this ax.axis uh, method, which I know, I'm so sorry, it is confusing. This has nothing to do with axis objects, which you still don't actually play with. So, yeah. And yes, it is a singular noun to refer both to X and Y, so, yeah. Um, so you can get the X min, X max, Y min, Y max. You can ask for it, but then you can also provide it as well, and it will be applied. Um, but most of the time, what you'll do is the tight or equal options, 
and what that will do is uh, it basically is the aspect ratio uh, whether, and also whether or not it's always going to be tight, uh, whether or not the uh, spacing in the X and Y are going to be equal, I mean, not necessarily equal limits, but that they would be spaced equal. So if, let's say the X limits go from uh, 10 to 100, but then the Y limits go from 20 to 30, it's going to be a very thin uh, thing because it will use up the, the Y uh, axis will use up the same amount of space for those 10 units that the X axis would have done for 10 units over the course of the entire 100 for its range. Um, so I'll show that example. So here I'm going to create three subplots. I'm going to plot three things. Um, I'm going to set titles, and I'm going to show different things. So here, first one is going to be completely normal. The second one is going to be tight. The third one is going to be equal to so the equal concept. So you got your padding and auto scaling. It's tight um, actually doesn't really. Um, do that much different now in version 2.0 is basically was the same thing. It's, it's not, it do, tight doesn't mean that it uh, gets rid of the padding. It's uh, it's just it's a little bit different. But equal um, yeah. So here the amount of space it took to do f those five units in Y is going to do the same amount here. So the distance here. We're going from negative 15 to 10, it's going to be the same as the distance here. So now the aspect ratio, it's not the aspect, that the, the data aspect is going to be equal. And so this is important when you draw a circle and you want your circle to look like a circle, which is funnily enough going to be one of our examples. Uh, uh, you can also, um, let's say, um, do we have any meteorologists in here, atmospheric scientists? Um, oftentimes, you know that the bottom of the atmosphere is, or, or, or your plot is going to be at height zero. But you don't know what the top level is going to be. So you can set one side or the other. You don't have to specify both sides of your limits. You can specify one or the other. So you can say, set y limb bottom equals negative 10. Set uh, x limb at the right 25. You don't, and, and you still let the other side of the limit be auto scaled. That's totally allowed. So I specified that it was gonna be the bottom, the Y limit was gonna be 10. I'm still pointing at my monitor. Um, so, but meanwhile, the top of it got auto scaled and auto limbed, but the right and the left uh, you know, followed exactly what I told it to do. So the right, the lim uh, or on the second axis, the right was defined at 25. But meanwhile, the normal padding happened over here on the left. Now, something that tends to happen that confuses a lot of people is if you specif if you do these sort of X and Y limb specification before you call plot and scatter. So when uh, in that case, uh, the X and Y limits are going to be figured out based upon the data that you have so far. Well, you haven't given it any data. So it's going to be really, really confused. So here it stopped at the Y limit here stopped at zero because that's the default. The usual default range is zero to one, and so since you had a negative, since you specified a negative ten, the other limit is going to be zero. Even though your data went up to here, you, by calling set x slim, you have forced it to make a decision. And then the same thing happened with the uh, with the second uh, plot as well, or a similar thing. I really got to talk to the Jupiter people. So it got all messed up. See, so you got that one marker there that's all cut off and everything because 
the X limit started at zero because it couldn't figure out how to auto scale it because you hadn't provided any data. Legends. So this is the other important thing with plots is that you, sure you could put up a graph of something, but and sure you can explain it all you want in your caption, but really you want a legend there so that people can quickly reference. Okay, this thing I see here refers to that. This thing I see here refers to that. So let's say I do a plot of some data. I can label that data. So most of the plotting functions, you can give a keyword argument of label equals, and you can give it some string to be a label. So we're going to pretend that these are temperature values here. And so we're going to say label equal Philadelphia, and second plot, label equal Boston. And we're going to uh, set our Y and X labels here. And then we're going to call axe.legend. Seems simple enough, right? Let's see what that does. It put a legend right here, Philadelphia, Boston. And now you can see what it is. It figured it out automatically because you gave it those labels. And so the legend, when you don't give it any arguments, the legends are going to go, okay, well, what data do I have that's been labeled? And it will come up uh, with labels for them. And it will, it will build a legend based off of that. Um, by default, in version 2.0 and later, if you don't specify the location, it will pick the best location. It will try to put the legend in a place where there, it does not obscure data. Uh, but however, you can also specify a specific location for it to go. So upper right, lower left, uh, center, if you wanted to put it in the center, whatever, you can do that. Um, and then there's also a specification of best. That is now the default. Uh, so, but it used to be not. Let's say you're plotting something and you don't want it to show up in the legend. You can give it a label of underscore no legend underscore. Uh, this is rare, but it's just useful to have because if you don't, because if you don't specify a label, legend is still going to do something. It'll just give it an empty entry. And if you really didn't want it to show up, then that's how you make it not show up at all. So here we have just the bar, foo bar, and meanwhile the line plot there did not show up. So, so real quick question on that. Mm -hmm. so, so MATLAB had the notion of handles, which don't want to get into that, but you would pass in essentially these handles, these references to the objects of only the ones that you wanted. Does, does MATPLOTLIB support that? Or you can yeah, in, in a slightly different way, but yes, it does. And there's documentation explaining it. There's documentation in the okay. legend, in, in the gallery for it. Okay. Um, and then there's also these things called proxy artists. Um, they're much more complicated, uh, but basically it lets you, so let's say you have um, a artist uh, you you want something to show up a certain way in the legend that doesn't show up, you know, it, it's complicated. So let's say you want something a different size or something, so or things like that. It's, it's complicated. We're also still working on expanding this. So, for example, one day it would be nice if we can have a legend for scatter plots, let's say. So that way you could show, it would be kind of like a color bar, but for the different size markers. You know, so it kind of be something like that. We haven't done that yet. There are people who can manually make it, but we don't have like a built-in function to do that. One day we want to get there, uh, but we have to still work on that a bit. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm gonna kind of move through the, uh, this, talk a little bit about that aspect, that aspect equal thing. So we have data here. We want to make sure it looks like a circle. We have a legend. Uh, so I'm, I'm not going to stop for this uh, example, but we got to make sure so we, we have the different circles here. Oops. So 
Again, label inner, label outer, different line width. We said that ax.ax is equal. So now it's gonna show up as a circle. If, if you didn't do that, you'll see what it looks like in a moment. See, it doesn't look like a circle, it looks skewed. But then if you say ax to ax is equal, ta-da, they look like a circle because it scaled everything in such a special way. Now, if you went in and specified the x limits, then that overrides that. So if you, and so that, that's the philosophy. If you specify that something is gonna be a certain way, that overrides any of the automat, auto magic type stuff. So. But then if you want to kind of tweak how the automatic magic stuff works, that's how you would do it. This is fun. So uh, the layouts, ticks, and spines. Um, no, I'm not talking about bugs and body parts and stuff. Uh, so one thing that gets people very confused is what is different? What are ticks? What are tick lines, tick labels, and tick gers? Okay, so a tick is the location in data space of a tick label. The tick line is the actual line that you see that displayed, so the little mark. Tick label is the label that goes nearby that tick mark. And the ticker is an object that determines which ticks to do automatically. So if you give it um, a limit of uh, 10 and 20 is going to decide I'm going to need a tick at, uh, I'm just going to pick some number, 12, 14, 16, and 18. It's going to decide that for you automatically. And it'll also do some things where which it can help uh, format the, uh, the ticks uh, labels. And you can uh, play around with tick params to uh, help configure that. Or oh, sometimes you get, get really advanced and start playing around directly with uh, some of these things. This is now the only, you know how I kept saying how you'll never play around with the axis object? I don't know if you realize this by now, but I do a lot of lying. Um, <laughs> this would be a situation where, yes, you do play around with the axis objects. So here, ax .x -axis set. This is not too different from ax.set, but there's ax.xaxis.set, so you're setting the properties for the x-axis object that belong to the axes object. So here we're gonna say that the ticks, the locations in data space, is gonna be the range one, two, three, and four. We get the range one through five. La the, but the labels are going to be 3, 100, negative 12, and the string foo. Because I can. Does that understand that distinction? So at the locations of 1, 2, 3, and 4, I'm going to put the labels of 3, 100, negative 12, and foo. By default, the labels are going to be the data values but you can override that. And that's what we're doing here, we're overriding it. The other thing we can do is those marks for the ticks, we can say uh, by default, they're, uh, well they used to be in and now out or the other way around, I never remember. You can say that you want the ticks to go in, in and out, just in, just out, whatever. You can also say how far you want the ticks to go. You can say on which axis you want them to be on. Ta -da. So here on the y-axis, you have your ticks going both ways, both in and out, and then 3, 100, negative 12, and foo. Can I ask a question? Mm-hmm. So for that axis, you, you have uh, the x-axis using 1, 2, 3, 4, correct? The location is, so the x limits are still one through four. Correct. And mm -hmm. on the second line, when you set ax dot x axis set, you specify the ticks and the ticks label. Tick, tick labels, sorry. Right, 
because by default, the labels would be derived from the data values. If, so if you take off the ticks and the range that you've given it, and you just use tick labels, it squeezes the ticks. I would avoid doing that. I know what you're getting at. Yeah. I would avoid doing it because then there's no guarantee that the ticker will choose the same number of ticks as the list of values, that list of labels you gave because it's automated. And so if it comes out different, then it's probably not going to work. So let's say the ticker choose that it's going to do ten, five ticks, mm -hmm. but you only gave it three values, uh, three tick labels. It's going to get confused. Okay. So in that case, you want to control that. So you want to specify both. Only specify both. Okay. Yeah. All right, thank you. Yeah. You can get away if you're lucky. Do you feel lucky? <laughs> do, do you? <laughs> Um, categoricals. Um, so I have a bunch of lovely fruits. Okay, I have two apples, three oranges, and one peach. So back in the old days of Matplotlib, you had to do a really awkward way to do this. It's a lot easier now. You literally just plot it the same way you always did, but as if it was numerical. So don't get confused by this zip. Here, all it is, I'm having myself a list of strings for fruit and a list of integers for value. So I'm going to pass in a list of strings for fruit and a list of uh, you know, integers for how many. I'm going to do a bar plot. It's going to look nice if you have version 2.0 or higher. Apples, oranges, and peaches. Oh, the zip thing. Um, you can so you can think of this here as a 2D array, if you will, a Python 2D array. If you do zip star of something, it's like doing a transpose. And it was really fun. If you do it again, it puts it back to the way it was. It's really cool. I like it. All right. So uh, spacing in between subplots. This is also something important that. Uh, comes out a lot. Um, you can use this uh, method for adjusting how much space is in between each of your subplots. Um, by default, we have certain default values, but you can make increase it or decrease it however you want. Uh, what tends to happen a lot um, is that it, by default, let's say you do a two by two thing and you have your uh, title for each one of these uh, subplots. Well, what ends up happening a lot is that the title ends up going right on top of the uh, tick labels for the uh, subplot above, or the uh, Y label will, will kind of blend right into the plot area for the one next to it. It's, it gets bad sometimes. So we have a method that helps um, uh, deal with that, and it's called tight layout. You can call fig dot tight layout. This is a magical thing. Okay? So if you're, let's say, doing an animation or something like that, and you may have things that may change or something like that, you shouldn't use t tight layout. You should explicitly say what the spacing should be. But this is useful for, I'm just making one plot, and I want it to look good. So let's, let's show you what happens when you don't have tight layout. This is how bad things can get sometimes. That looks terrible, doesn't it? All right? But this magical little method Ta da! Magic. Okay? And it will automatically adjust things in such a way so that way uh, things don't overlap. Okay? Um, let's say you have a more complicated layout. So, you know, these are very simple grids, and this satisfies most people's needs. But let's say, let's say you have a need, you want two uh, subplots up here, and a third subplot to span this distance down here. You use grid spec for stuff like that, okay? And then there's also the uh, 
there's also a few other things uh, available in Matplotlib to do that. Um, I'm not going to get into it, but you can do it. Another feature I love is sharing axes, and especially I do this a lot because I might be viewing multiple images. So I might have, let's say, an image of some processing result from an old version of my code and an image of the processing result from a new version of my code. And I'm trying to look and see what the difference is, do a qualitative analysis. Um, and so I want to zoom in and pan. Well, I want them both to zoom in to the same place. I want them both to pan together and move. And this is what share X and share Y is for. So now we have here two subplots and I'm going to pan the sucker around. See, they both move together. Before, without it, if you uh, had, let's say, let's just set share X to false, which is the default. And if I did that pan, it moved together in the Y because I did share Y, but share X I turned off. They're independent. So, twinning axes. Uh, this is a, a lot of people don't know what this is called, so uh, they don't know to find this. But it's called twinning. So I have the normal. So the first uh, y-axis is here, but then the twinned axis may have a different scale or might have something different, so it's a separate plot, but it's put on the same plot area. Something some people like to do for various reasons. Uh, you may want to play around with the axis spines. So, uh, show some examples here. Uh, so this first one is gonna be this, I'm gonna mess around with the spines a bit. So I took away the top spine. So you see that that black line is now gone. Usually the black lines on he here is now gone. Um, what else did I do there? I, uh, yeah, I set the visible to false. But I said that there was, uh, that the tick positions were gonna be, uh, that's right, yeah. So there's no black line and then there's also no tick marks here. So that's gone. So now let's do So now I'm going to move the spine so that, um, that they're away from the plot area by uh, 10 points. Ta-da! So now they're not actually on the plot area, they're off the, of the plot area. You can then also, uh, oops. You can have the spines be intersected at a particular spot in data space. This gets into the transforms that I was talking about before. You're not doing any transforms, but you're telling it to use the data space. And now, you're moving around your X and Y limits and such, but the spines are staying intersected at zero, zero. And then another thing you could do is to have it set to a fixed spot in the plot area. So there, I'm saying I wanted some fractional spot in the plot area, and if I then pan around, nifty. All right, I'm going to be zooming along here. I'm not going to worry too much about this, but here, what I have here are two subplots, but I took away the space. I got rid of the spacing in between there so that they would come up right next to each other. And then I mucked about with the spine, so that way the x-axis spine showed up here and had the labels put in, but then, um, it's all normal down here. 
Um, again, we're not going to get into this because we've got to move on, but you can uh, load up that example later in your own uh, free time, the copious amount of free time that we all have. All right, part five, artists. This uh, should be pretty straight. So we, I, you, I've hinted to about artists before. It is anything that is visible. If you can see it, it's an artist. All right, and so uh, artist is, is, is a uh, major un underpinning. And so don't worry too much about this code, but this is just to kind of show you what some of the artists that we have. We have wedges, arrows, line 2D, fancy box patch, ellipse, rectangle, circle, polygon, path patch. Uh, we actually have a few others as well. Um, these are all available to use. Uh, these, so all the plotting functions you've seen, the bar, plot, scatter, things like that, they take the data that you provide it and all the properties you specify and it's creating all these artists for you. And that's what gets returned by those plotting functions. So you can imagine you could create your own plotting function that takes in a bunch of data, you instantiate a bunch of artist uh, objects and attach them to the axes that, uh, that has uh, been specified, and voila, you have your own plotting function just like matplotlib functions do. Um, and some people do this. They come up with these specialized uh, plotting functions that maybe they do a bunch of statistical processing first and then display something or whatever. So here, we, we played with this. So plot dot plot, we get the tuple of lines, and we're going to muck with the line width and maybe the alpha. This kind of just reminds you of what we've done before. We did this earlier with the bar plots where the negative bars were recolored a different way. So here you do the same thing with plot. You can do things like that. You can find out what properties are available to you with the getP um, uh, function. So you can see all the different things that are available. Some of these things you wouldn't actually be playing with yourself, but uh, these are other things that you can muck about with and change if you wanted to. Okay, so then now I talked about individual artists, but then for optimization purposes, we talked about that with the plot, the difference between plot and scatter and why you would do line style none. Uh, for optimization purposes, we have a collection of uh, markers that all are the same, or we would have a collection where in which uh, they might have different values, but we're able to share a bunch of other properties and stuff. So a lot of things we have are actually line collections, which is just a collection of line 2D objects. We have patch collections and polygon collections and things like that. Um, and we're able to muck about with these things. So that way you don't have to set all the individual attributes. You could just say, I want this collection to be red. I want this collection to follow this size or something like that. There you go. So this is one line collection, but it's made of three lines. And they all have the same color now and all the same line width. Now, you can, in some cases, in some situations, you can specify an individual um, uh, property. So in this case here for this line collection, you can say, I want the first one to be red, the second one to be blue, and the third one to follow this RGB tuple. And I want the line width to be four, three, and six for the three lines that I have. There you go. These are esoteric advanced features. Most of the time you're never gonna need it, but you know that it exists, is, is possible to do. Um, so here, uh, we're going to do some pentagons here. So you're able to take in a bunch of data 
and you and you can say I want the date to set off by offsets and then here we have a trans you know you specify the transform it's going to be the data space to treat it all in so that way when you zoom well, so the offset you know, the, the, uh, the, the Pentagon didn't get any larger but they're in the correct space but meanwhile I could have done it I could have specified a different transform and it would have followed something different all right so as a uh, reward give yourself four gold stars um, so I mean we're, we're wrapping up here there is actually one more part but there's more, talking more about the toolkits if you guys uh, there are nifty little things you can go and look at it yourself um, in your own free time but if anybody have any questions uh, if you just want to play around with this example uh, here feel free but uh, this is pretty much the uh, entire tutorial so I hope you guys enjoyed this I hope you guys have a better understanding of Matplotlib and plotting and I hope you guys uh, I wish you all happy uh, publishing <laughs> so and happy uh, data interpretations all right so you guys want me to do this example or? Thank you.